a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Of the circus. Jerry of the Circus. Hey, Greg. What are you doing around the backyard on moving night? What's your matter? Oh, I don't believe I understand you as well as Jerry and Bumps do. Oh, you're, you're certainly trying hard to tell me something, but I'm sorry, Rex. I just don't understand, though. Jerry? Jerry? Come on, Rags. <laughs> Something's wrong, or you wouldn't have come running up to me barking like you did. <laughs> well, we'll find out what the trouble is, Rags. Don't you worry. Well, of all things, Jerry Dugan, what are you sitting here on the steps all alone for? You look as though you've lost your last friend. What's the matter, Jerry? <laughs> Nothing. Oh, no? Come on, now. Honest confession is good for the soul. Honest, nothing's wrong. Well, Rag seems to think there is, and, and I do too. You see? Look at that poor dog stare at you. Now, you haven't got that long face for nothing, Jerry, do you? Something's troubling you. Well, if you must know it, it's about Spike. Spike? What about him? Well, sure we are leaving this town tonight and getting still farther away from him. Uh-huh. I haven't been able to find out a thing. Well... I don't believe I, I understand you, Jerry. I just know he didn't pass that counterfeit money. Well, well, he did spend that one ten dollar bill and that was counterfeit. You know, he said it when you were with him. I know it, Patsy, but he got that bill from Belko. Belko gave him ten dollars for fixing his trunk. Spike didn't know it was counterfeit. I'm positive. Well, don't take it to heart, though, Jerry. Oh, I can't help it. I, I like Spike, and I'll bet anything in the world that he's innocent. Well, Jerry, you've got to think of yourself, too. You can't help Spike by worrying about him. Uh, were you at dinner tonight? Uh-uh. I wasn't hungry. Mm-hmm. That's just what I thought. You didn't even go into the mess out, did you? No. You've got to get a hold of yourself, Jerry. You can't go without food. Uh, are you all packed and ready to go down to the station? Uh-huh. Bumps is in with slats getting their props put away. I was just waiting for him. Uh, you have to wait for him? No. Why? Well, uh, how about you and I walking over to the train together? Will you come with me? If you want me to. Oh, I do. I, I guess Ryan's will wait here for Bumps, won't he? Sure. Well, come on, then. I, I've got an idea. What is it? I'm going into the restaurant down there at the station and get something to eat. Will you join me? Sure, I'll, I'll go with you, but I don't want anything to eat. Well, now, Jerry, won't you just have a sandwich or a piece of pie and some ice cream? Well. Doesn't that sound good? Well, all right, I'll, I'll get some. Come on, let's hurry, then, so we'll have time to eat before we have to get on the train. <laughs> Some more coffee, gents? No, thanks. Just give us our checks. Okay. Yeah. 20, 15, 25. There you are. 
Well, here's your check. Thank you. Now, you listen to me, Belko. I'm the brains of this deal. Oh, Slippery Tornetti, the wise guy. You are the brains, are you? Nobody's smart, but Slippery, I suppose. Pipe it down, let me talk. Oh, no, no, all right. All right. Mm. Now, the reason I wanted to meet you tonight and talk to you is important. What is important? Now, get this. I don't want you to pass any more dough. Why? Ain't I doing all right? Listen, stupid. Belko is not stupid. The great Belko is smart. Didn't I plant those bills like you told me to? And didn't they get to that fellow Spike? I'm no dummy, Slippery. And I ain't gonna stand for you to call me stupid. All right, all right, all right. You're not stupid. Sure, you did a swell job. Yeah. They got that fellow Spike and he'll do a long stretch, so that's taken care of. Then why not get rid of some more of the money? Because the cops think they've got the right guy. Yeah? Well, can't you see? If you go spreading more of that money around... They'll know they make a mistake, or else they didn't get the whole gang, and they'll be hot again. Mm. They'll watch everybody with the circus with an eagle eye, just like they've been doing, you see. Mm, uh, I won't pass so much, then. You're not going to pass any. That is a fine thing. You cut me in on this, and then you make me quit. You double-cross me, Slippery. That's what you do. Now, listen. I'm saving you a nice long stretch in jail. Yeah? You told me when I start, I'd be able to make a couple of thousand dollars for my side. All right, all right. You will if you listen. Mm -hmm. There's no hurry with this racket. Wait until the circus season is over and you can start in again. But right now, you got to quit. Can't you understand that if more counterfeiters pass now after they got spiked... Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. Uh. You think the cops will start watching the circus again? Huh? That's right. Uh. That's just what I got through saying a little while ago. Uh. But what if I'm careful? I mean more careful than I'm the not going over that again. Yeah, but... How much of the money you got left? Not so much. I think maybe a couple of hundred dollars. Okay, uh, give it to me. Mm -hmm. That's one way to make sure you won't pass it. Well, I haven't got it with me. What are you trying to pull? Is it a stunt, eh? Oh, no. I do not go carrying that only money around on me. I told you, Belko was smart. What is it? I got a trick belt that I wear when I'm doing my act. And it has got a sort of a pocket in it. And I keep the money in there. Uh, where's the belt now? It's uh, packed in my trunk. Most likely on the train by now. Your own personal trunk? Yeah. You got it locked? Sure. What you think? I leave it open? All right, all right. Now, get this. Hmm. Tomorrow, I want you to mail that money to me. Understand? Mail it to you. You heard me. Yeah. Make a little package of it and send it to the mail. You know where to send it. Yeah, yeah, I know. All right, then. Be sure you get it off to me tomorrow. Hmm. You know, it's going to be a low, whole lot safer for me to have counted my money than for you to have it, you know. What you mean by that? Well, the cops may still watch the circus for a little while yet, and well, you can't tell. It's better to be safe. Oh, hey, i got to watch my time. That train I catch will be pulling out soon. Uh, are you going to write to me? Oh, sure, sure. We'll keep in touch. I sure want to go back to work for you. It's about the easiest job I ever... Huh? Oh, it's Jerry and Patsy. Hello, Belko. Hey, didn't you get enough supper tonight? <laughs> the great Belko needs a lot of food, Jerry. Oh, hello, Patsy. Hello, Belko. Uh, let's sit up at the counter here, Fancy. Oh, don't you want to sit in one of these booths? No, the counter's all right. Unless you want to sit in a booth. No, no, the counter will do. Well, what'll it be, folks? Mm, what do you say, Jerry? Uh, some kind of a sandwich? I just don't know. Let me look at this menu a minute. Uh, excuse me a minute. I'll have to answer the phone. Oh, all right. There's no hurry. Hey, Betsy. Yes, Jerry? See that man sitting with Belko in the booth? Yes. I wonder who he is. He came back to see Belko last week when we were playing in Lindsay or one of those towns. Oh, he's probably just a friend of Belko's, Jerry. Yeah, I suppose so. Hi. What are you so interested in him for? I think I've seen him someplace before. Well, you just said that you saw him when he came back to see Belko. Yeah, but I mean, besides that. Oh. Is he looking this way now? Um, no, they're talking. Then I'm going to take another look at him. Say. What, Jerry? Remember that picture I told you about? No. What picture? I told you Spike gave me a picture of the football team when he was in prison. Oh, oh, that. Uh, yes, uh-huh. And he pointed out the picture of his cellmate. I was just wondering if that's where I could have seen this man. <laughs> now, Jerry, more detective work? You never can tell. Hey, I've got that picture right here in my pocket. I'm going to look. Let's see. 
Oh, I hear this. Let me see it, Jerry. See? This is Pipe. Uh-huh. And this man next to him, this is his cellmate, Tony. Oh. Tony. What was his name? Oh, yeah. Tonetti. Hey. Shh, Jerry. Not too loud. It's him. See? Look at those bushy eyebrows. Hmm. Yeah, this picture does look like that man. Uh, I'm sure it's him, Patsy. And if it is... Well, what are you going to do? Is he looking this way now? You can see better than I can. Um, no, no, he's looking straight ahead. Patsy, that's who it is. That man is Tonetti, and he was a counterfeiter. Now I'm getting someplace. Oh, they're getting ready to leave now. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. That was a butcher on the phone. I had to give him my meat order for tomorrow. Oh, that, that's all right. Well, I'll take your order now. Just a, a glass of milk. Oh, I, I thought you were going to have something to eat, Jerry. I haven't got time. You better have milk, too. we got to hurry up and get out of here. Mm, I see what you mean. Yes, waiter, just a couple of glasses of milk. All right. They're leaving now, Jerry. Say, we'll have to hurry. What are you going to do? Oh, we'll have to find Mr. Hadley or Mr. Randall and tell him. Bye-bye, Jerry and Patsy. See you on the train. Oh, all right, Delco. Yeah, we'll see you later. Ah, uh, here you are. Hurry up, Patsy, and drink the milk. Here's the money, waiter. Uh, thank you, young man. Gosh, you've got me all excited, Jerry. I believe he is the same man as on that prison picture with Spike. I know it is. <laughs> I can't drink this milk so fast. Well, come on, then. I, I don't want to let him out of our sight. Good night. Good night. Where did they go now? Oh, there they are. Uh-huh. Hey, that fellow's getting on that train. Is Bilko going with it? Oh, no. No, no, he's just talking to him. Oh, boy. Hmm. Oh. Just my luck. He's leaving on that train. Now what will I do? Oh, we better find Mr. Randall and tell him anyway. Yeah, or Mr. Hadley. Come on, Patsy. Well, there goes Bilko back into the station. Good. We'll go right over to Mr. Randall's car. I sure hope he's down here already. Uh-huh. Through the gate. Yeah, that's right. What do you make of all this, Jerry? Lenny. It's <laughs> all that means the fact that I can't quite piece it together. Well, I'll tell you just what I think. I think Belko's the one that's been passing the money. You do? I sure do. But, but why Belko? Well, don't you see? The very fact that Belko was talking with, what's his name, Tanetti, is proof that they've got some dealings together. What else would it be? Oh, uh, yeah, I see what you mean. I wouldn't be surprised if Belko gave Spike that counterfeit bill just so he'd get caught. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe even planted all that phony money in his mattress. Well, I hope we're not too late, Jerry. I just hope Belko comes along with the circus now. You you don't think he might skip the show? Oh, I sure hope not. Oh, look, Jerry. There's Mr. Randall now, just crossing over by his car. Mr. Randall? Uh, oh, yes, Jerry? Oh, wait a minute. I want to talk to you. Okay, Jerry. Uh, what's in your mind? <laughs> you're... You're all excited. What's wrong? Is Mr. Hadley around any place? Mr. Hadley? No, not now, but I expect him before long. Why? Well, I've just made a very important discovery. I, I think I've found out who, who the real counterfeiter is. I only hope I'm, I'm not too late. <laughs>
Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in a true story. Tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the true story of five polar explorers and their race against death. A radio dramatization of The Diary of Captain Scott. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Hey, Wilcox, you're under arrest. What for, Sheriff? Well, and make it a fast getaway, that's what for. Oh, not I, Sheriff. It's those ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs in my car. They're experts on fast getaways. And they can't be beat for smoother performance and gas savings, either. Well, then I want them Autolite spark plugs for my car. You bet you do, Sheriff. Everybody wants those world-famous, ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. So why not have your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer check the exact condition of your spark plugs with his exclusive Autolite plug check indicator? And if they're worn out or wrong for your style of driving, he'll recommend those gas-saving, super-smooth, ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. How do I find my nearest Autolite spark plug dealer, Wilcox? Why, just phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. She'll gladly tell you the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with the diary of Captain Scott and the performance of Mr. Herbert Marshall, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Wednesday, January 18th, 1912. Camp 69, temperature minus 22 degrees a.m. The South Pole. We have arrived yet, but under very different circumstances from those expected. We've had a horrible day. The elation ran high all morning since we were nearing our goal and thought to be the first five men to reach the pole. But our hopes were dashed when Evans sighted a flag in a tent near the spot. The Norwegians have forestalled us and are first to get here. In the empty tent, under the name of their leader, Raoul Amundsen, were listed the five men who were with him. It's a terrible disappointment. And I'm very sorry for my loyal companions. There's no doubt of it now. They did find an easier way up over the barrier. Well, we thought as much back at Cape Armitage. It's a rotten shame, men, and I'm sorry. Good Lord, Captain Scott, you've done everything you could. And there's more to do. More for all of us. 800 miles, as a matter of fact. Are you ready to start back, Evans? I can't think of a reason to stay in this ruddy, miserable place. Is the sledge ready, Oates? A bit frozen in, I suppose. Yes, I imagine. Wilson, do you vote to start? The faster, the better, Captain. Bauer, can you get a sight and start us off on course? Sky is a bit overcast, but I think so. Yes, uh, I think I can. We'll go then, as quickly as we can. The minute saved here will mean a minute more of comfort aboard the ship. January 18th, temperature minus 26 p.m. The moment of departure is here. It is impossible to collect our thoughts since few of them are voiced. But I know the same are with all of us. Can we pull the heavy sleds with great distance? 800 miles of a trackless windswept barrier and drift. Can we find the carefully arranged supply camps being left on our trail? Can we trust our navigation instruments? Can we survive? January 21st, temperature minus 31.4. This morning, while freeing the sledge from the ice, Evan snatched his hand. I'm afraid the poor chap is in for trouble. His wounds were not closed in this cold. And we absolutely cannot spare the time to camp as our rations are very low, as well as our fuel. January 28th, night camp. Temperature minus 27. The miles continue to fall behind us, but with painful slowness. Our diet and with it our general condition has improved since finding our have to be supply camp. Only 42 miles to the next one, but we're not without ailments. Oates is suffering from a very cold foot. Evan's hands and face are in a horrible state. 
And tonight Wilson is suffering tortures from snow blindness. Bowers and I are the only ones without trouble at present. Don't try to help, Evans. Just holes of the thread. I wasn't helping, Captain. I've got the rest anyway. I get dizzy. Don't, don't sit down, Evans. Step on your feet. Can't we put him in his sleeping bag and put him on the sled? No. I won't do that. We can pull him. I won't do it. If it's for the good of the rest of us, Evans. No, no. I'll stay here first. Then, if it's an order. No. Not that kind of an order. I won't be dragged on by the rest of you. Then you've got to come along. Seven or eight more miles, Evans. Then we'll be stopping for some rest and a hot meal. I'm not thinking of those miles. How many more seven miles are there? Let's cover these. How before. many more? Seven. I'll do the best I can. I'm sorry, Evan. And everything will be all right? Yes. All right. There'll be hot food in a few more hours. Let's move on. February 11th, temperature minus 26.2. The worst day we've had during the trip and greatly owing to our own fault. We started on the wretched surface, pulling on threads. The light was horrible. Dull by fog, it made everything look fantastic. As we went on, the light grew worse, and we found ourselves in pressure. Then came the fatal decision to steer east. The disturbance grew worse, and my spirit received a very rude shock. The farther we plunged ahead, the less possible it seemed that we could find a way out. We struggled until 9 p.m. to do nothing more but make camp. There is no getting away from the fact that we are not pulling strong. James Billy Pony Sledge. John Wright Pony Sledge. Your eyes, Wilson. How are they? Better, I think. Let me see. Yes, I think they are. Oh, Evans. George. Oh, uh, yeah. What were you saying? Was I saying something? I didn't think I was. I thought I was asleep. Perhaps you were. Know what you were saying, Evans? You were naming the schools that donated sledges for the expedition. Oh, I thought I was asleep. Must have been dreaming about home. I like it better there than I do here. I mean, I like dreaming about it. I like it. Get as much rest as you can, Evans. You want an early start. Well, how's your foot? All right, it's better, Captain. It bothers a bit in the morning, but then it gets better. Good. How do you get along so well, Captain? Oh, because I know everything is going to be all right. Are you just cheering us up, or do you really think so? Of course I think so. You know as well as I, what splendid planning we've had. Everything's going precisely as it should. There's a line of supply camps right back to the ship. All we've got to do is follow it. February 17th, a very terrible day, although we got out of the turmoil. Evans looked a little better after a good sleep and declared he was all right. He started in his place on the traces, but half an hour later, he had to leave the sledge and follow behind. At the first rest stop, he came up very slowly. He stayed with us for a while, then dropped out again. We tried to pull him on the sledge, but had not the strength, and he fell behind at lunch camp, we saw him coming far astern, and when we looked again, he had fallen. Evan, is he alive? Wait. Sir, get him to his feet. Get him moving. Come on, Evan. Evan. Oh, no. Let me go. Walk, walk, man. Walk, Evan. I don't want to. Go and get the other bowers. Bring the thread. Right. Evans, Evans, wait for me. You can't lie here. You've got to move. Evans, come on, get up. You have to do it. They can't lift you. Over there. Over there by the tree. Go fetch. Over there. When we got him into the tent, he was quite comatose. And he died quietly at 12.30 p.m. It's a terrible thing to lose a companion that way. His passing is a frightfully personal thing to each of us. 
As is usual, our doubts and fears are not voiced. But I don't think that one of us does not wonder how many of the remaining four can survive. Bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in The Diary of Captain Scott. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, well, Charles, are them Autolite spark plugs really as slick as a hair tail? Ah, you bet they are, Sheriff. You see, Autolite spark plugs are designed by the same Autolite engineers who designed the coil, distributor, starting motor, generator, and all the other important parts of the complete ignition systems used as original equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. Well, what about that Autolite resistor spark plug? Why, Sheriff, that Autolite resistor spark plug gives double life, greater gas savings, and smoother performance as compared to spark plugs without a built-in resistor. And what's more, it reduces spark plug interference with radio and television reception. The Autolite resistor spark plug is just one of a complete line of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs designed and built for every use. So, friends, take a tip from me and have your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer check your spark plug soon. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of the Diary of Captain Scott, a true story well calculated to keep you in suspense. February 22nd, night camp. Temperature minus 22.9. There's little doubt we are in for a rough and critical time going home. And the lateness of the seas may make it rather serious. We never won the march of eight and a half miles with greater difficulty than we did today. We've come now a bit more than half the distance, which leaves almost 400 distressing miles of dragging still before us. On the bright side, we found another supply camp and have ten full days of provisions and have less than 70 miles to the next camp. <laughs> February 25th, night camp. Temperature minus 23.2. A little despondent again. So very really terrible to trust. Oates' foot is almost completely gone. He is helpless. It leads to pulling up to Wilson, almost totally blind now. Bowers and me. And we do not do well at all. The truth is, there's not enough energy in our rations. Without tremendous intakes of energy in this cold, we suffer physically and mentally, too. There is little communication between us in the tent at night now. Yes? What is it, Scott? Well, I thought I heard something. I thought you said something, didn't you? No. Bowers. I've got to talk to you, Bowers. Oh, of course. I, Bowers, I'm terribly worried. I didn't think it was you who called. I I heard my wife. Under these conditions, I Wait, hardly think... you. It started last night. I was with her, Bowers, and there wasn't a dream. I was lying awake, looking up at the peak of the tent. And suddenly I was with her. In our library at home. You must have been dreaming. No, I wasn't. I could feel everything and smell everything. The perfume she was wearing, the warmth from the fire. I was warm, Bowers. I was warm, even after I came back here. No dream can accomplish that. I went home. I held her in my arms. And we went up to see our son. It was night, and he was asleep. And then we went back to the library and sat before the fire. And it was warm. I'm sorry that he's asleep, Bob. But it is late. I know. Every time. And oh, what tales I'll have to tell him. Of 
courageous men serving their country. I'll make him proud to be an Englishman. Oh, I'm sure he will be, darling. Above all, we must guard him against indolence. We must make him a, a strenuous man. Interest in a natural history, better than game. He'll be a good man. And you, Kate, if I could tell you the millions of thoughts I've had of you. I was with you, I think. I worried so. I knew you must have been suffering. There was but some. There's bound to be when a feat is as great as ours. The years of planning. 800 miles we marched to the pole. 800 back. But what wealth we brought to the scientists. And what honor we brought to England. Your home, darling. And that's more important than science and honor. Your home and you won't ever go away again. No. I've served my duty, I think. I shall collect and arrange my notes. Perhaps I shall write a book and describe the bottom of the world and living there. But never go back. The drift snow, like finest flower, flickering up under one's clothing and singing the sand blast. But never go back. The great cloudy columns of snowdrift advancing from the south and heralding the storm. But never go back. No, I like it here. I'm warm. Warm. I'm warm. It was a dream, Scott. Good Lord, it's nothing to worry about. It was not a dream. All of your senses don't coordinate in a dream. You don't smell and touch and feel. Well, I told you. If it's the first sign of a breakdown, I wanted you to know. Oh, of course it isn't. You're in splendid shape. Thanks, Bowers. I owe you a great deal. Nonsense. At least I owe you the privilege of getting into the sleep. Good night, Bowers. Good night. Minus 41.5. But our fortunes have changed. At least the future looks brighter. Bauer's excellent navigating has kept us precisely on course, and on it we found an unexpected supply tent containing rations and a note addressed to me. The men back at the Cape had taken it upon themselves to change plans, for which we are happy. The next camp, we expected only supplies, has been enlarged and manned. We are to be met there with dog sedges. At that point, our dragging days are finished. And only 24 and a half miles away. March 2nd, night camp. All the elation of yesterday has been crashed. Misfortune rarely comes singly. This day we have suffered three distinct blows. First, through some oversight, our fuel or supply is less than half what we thought it was. Second, Tiger Oats just closed his feet. They show very bad indeed. They will never be saved. Last year, the weather has turned on us. Blizzard conditions are extreme. We are in a very tight place indeed. But none of us is despondent, or at least none shows it. March 10th. Things steadily going downhill. Midday, minus 43. Blizzard still with us. Oats unable to go on until camp at noon. I've covered only 11 miles in eight days past. Captain. Yes, Oats. It's uh, quite difficult to say this without sounding heroic, but I'm going to die, and I know it. No, you aren't, Oats. You mustn't talk like that. Uh, it's no good, Captain. I, I know I am, and I'm not afraid. Stop that, Oats. I know what I'm saying. And the quicker it happens, the better. I'm not going to hold the rest of you back. I know how I felt about poor Evan. He was holding us back, and I knew he was going to die, and I was angry at him for keeping on as long as he did. Oh, what kind of talk is that, Oates? Oh, it's the truth, and I don't care. When he was holding us back, and I knew there was no chance of him, I wanted him to die. Well, I don't know what the rest of you were thinking, but that's what I was. And now I'm holding you back. And I won't have that. I want you to leave me. We'll not leave you, Oates. Please, Captain. I'm not afraid. I'd like to go. I, I'm, I'm tired and it hurts, and I'd like to go to sleep and not wake up. I, I, I've no family to leave like the rest of you. 
We won't leave you, Oates. You know that. I want it that way. I'll, I'll get in my sleeping bag and I'll just sleep. I'm not afraid. I want to. We can't do that, Oates. Even if we agreed with you, we couldn't leave you. Please, Captain, you know I'm right. All of you know. Please, Captain. Please. of dates, but I think the last is correct. Poor Titus Oates is gone. Should this journal be found, I want these facts recorded. This was his end. He woke in the morning yesterday. It was blowing a blizzard. He said, I'm just going outside. I can't be long. He went out into the blizzard, and we have not seen him since. miles away from the sedge camp. But ill fortune touches my right foot is gone. Two days ago, I was proud possessor of the best feet. Now one is gone. The others are still confident of getting through, but I don't know. March 21st. Scotland and 11 miles of dog sledge camp yesterday. The blizzard forced us to lay up. We cannot move against it. We do not dare to leave the tent. We would surely die if we did. Bob? Oh, Bob? Here I am, Bob. Here I am. Here I am, Bob, over here. Oh, I didn't see you. So nice in the sun. I thought I'd sit out for a bit. Too nice. <laughs> nothing like this at your precious South Pole. <laughs> no, nothing like this. Down there, even when the sun is high, it's always weak and diffuse. And because of the reflection from the ice on, on every side, there never is a definite shadow over the number of shadows of any man or object. I think you love it. No, I hate it. Five men march to the pole and they say they've conquered it. But they haven't. It will conquer them. You'll never go back, will you? No. I didn't want you to go, remember? I was afraid you wouldn't come back. Do you remember when I said that? Yes, I remember. And I laughed at you, didn't I? I was such a coward. I laughed and told you that I would conquer it. Just for you. That I would name a glacier for you. And I asked you how a woman could act when a glacier is named after her. Well, I didn't name a glacier for you. But I thought of you, Kate. I thought and dreamed of you so often. It's important that you know that. It's important that you know that. I think of you constantly. You and our son, he must be active. He must be strong. And you must protect him, and he must protect you. Scott. Kate, I love you. If this... Scott! Why, well, uh, uh, yes, yes, for Bowers. Wilson is dead. Oh, uh, Wilson. Oh, uh, Wilson is dead. Since the 21st, Bowers and I, surviving Wilson, have had a continuous gale and blizzard from west south west and south west We had fuel to make two cups of tea apiece and bear food for two days on the 20th. Every day we've been ready to start for the dog shed camp, 11 miles away. But outside the door of the tent, it remains a scene of whirling drift. I do not think we can hope any better things now. We shall stick it out to the end. But we are getting weaker, of course. And the end cannot be far. It seems a pity. But I do not think I can write much more. 
this rough journal and our dead bodies must tell the story. In dying, we have... formed by Captain Scott's comrades at the main depot at Cape Armitage, set out and found his body, along with that of Bowers and Wilson. Search was carried on for Oates and Evans, but they were never found. A great cairn was built at the site of Scott's final camp, a trivial monument to the courage of five men, and especially to the complete devotion to duty of Robert Falcon Scott, who until his dying breath continued to keep a record of the fatal journey. Presented by Autolite, tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. And once again, here is Mr. Marshall. Bart, we enjoyed your performance as Captain Scott, and we hope you'll be back with us again soon. Thank you, Harlow. All you have to do is to ask me. An invitation from Autolite to appear on suspense is, uh, well, it's as welcome as a letter from home. Well, what? It is like a letter from home because, you see, we count you a member of the Autolite family, along with the 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers, the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast, and the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Well, hello to all of the Autolite family, may I say thank you, and to our listeners, may I say good night, and remember, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Next week, another true story about an almost legendary man. The dramatic recreation of The Shooting of Billy the Kid, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy. The program will be heard on... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Marwick and conducted by Lud Luskin. The soloist tonight was Eloise. The Diary of Captain Scott was adapted for suspense by Gil Dowd. In tonight's story, June Whitley was heard as Kate, Tudor Owen as Bowers, Ben Wright as Oates, Joseph Kearns as Evans, and Charles Davis as Wilson. Herbert Marshall may be heard each week on his own radio program, The Man Called X. And remember next week on Suspense... Mr. Frank Lovejoy in The Shooting of Billy the Kid. For the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug or Autolite battery dealer, or your nearest authorized Autolite service station, phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. Mutual presents Arch Obler's Plays. The Mutual Broadcasting System has the pleasure of presenting the tenth broadcast of a special 26-week series of plays by radio playwright Arch Obler. In this series, we hope to bring you dramas full of the excitement and meaning of plays told in relation to the expanding world in which we live. Our drama this evening, through the cooperation of Lester Cowan Productions, stars Mr. Burgess Meredith in Mr. Pyle. The play will be introduced by Arch Obler. Ernie Pyle was a thin little man with a balding head and a shy grin. 
hardly the dashing, glamour-filled war correspondent of fiction. And yet he became the most popular war correspondent of our time. And the buddy of every soldier from the generals down the line in the very unglamorous business that is war. I've written a factual play about Ernie Pyle because to many who have had to stay on this side of the oceans, he was their eyes and their heart. About there, Mr. Pyle. That's good. Phoebe sure made this road in a hurry. About six hours. Great boy. Yeah. I think just about as far into the jungle we should go. Whatever you say. Uh, I think I better let the engine cool off a little. Yeah. Um, Mr. Pyle. Yes, Lieutenant. <laughs> Back home, I used to be the fellow who went around with his foot in his mouth. Can I ask you something that's none of my business? What's on your mind? Well, why are you here, Mr. Pyle? Me? I'm just cannon fodder, but you, you're an old man of 44. <laughs> Not exactly old, but well, old enough to stay away from this dirty Jap hellhole. Africa, Sicily, Normandy, you've been through it all. Why don't you stay home once you got back there? I, I just couldn't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. And did you know Captain Bessman was operated on last night? Yes, I know. It, it's the craziest thing. All night long, the morphine didn't put him out. He kept talking. He seemed to think he was on a troop transport on his way to Pearl Harbor from San Francisco. That's mm-hmm. all he talked about. As if that was all that had ever happened to him, going from Frisco to Pearl Harbor. Can you beat that? He's in every campaign from Gua to Okinawa, and then he gets hurt, and all he talks about is the first ship he is on. Goofy, isn't it? Mm, no, Lieutenant. Huh? When you've been through a great deal, it all gets covered up with a confusion of many things. The torpedoes that didn't hit you, the dive bombers that missed you, the shells that almost had your number. It seems your mind can't take it anymore. You're, you're like a man who's lived a full life, and then in old age... You, Remembers clearly only the days of his childhood. That's the way it is sometimes in war. Sometimes you remember only when you were young in the war. The first things that uh, happened to you. Is, is that the way it was with you? That's the way. Will you tell me, Mr. Pyle? Mm-hmm. Tell you why. What you remember? Why? So I can tell my kids when I get some that... You told me? Well, I remember the convoy because I remember faces. Thousands of them crowded together on the boat. The faces of American boys going. They didn't know where to fight and perhaps to die. A long way from home. Thousands of American faces. But as we went southward, out of those many faces came single faces. The individual boys from Akron to Decatur to Nashville to Carmel to Slocum Hollow, Woodstock, Spokane, Troy, San Francisco, who in the last analysis fight the wars, win them for us. That's what I remember. As long as I live, I'll remember... Every face and every name. Private Max Rosen. At night, as the escort ships of the Royal Navy herded us safely through the soft, dangerous night, little Private Max Rosen used to stand by the rail with me, hour after hour, looking out over that armada of marching ships. Hello, Mr. Pyle. That's an awful lot of water. Yes, it is. Is it true we're on our way to Casablanca? I couldn't say. Oh. Military security, huh? <laughs> Maybe that's it. Casablanca. Eddie, I love you. Eddie, I want... I want to run barefoot through your hair. 
Hey, you know, Mr. Pye, you ought to put me in your column. Why is that, Max? I think I'm the only fellow that ever came from the Bronx and never saw the ocean. That is, until they shipped me over. Never saw it? It's a fact. Well, My mama strictly didn't believe in Coney Island, and since the ocean to her was Coney Island, I never got to see the ocean. You've seen enough of it now. Yes, sir. Sure is a big world, isn't it, Mr. Pyle? At last, I'm getting to see some of it. And Mama can't stop me. I remember Sergeant Matt Miller of Highland Park, Illinois. It was the last couple of nights before we made that North African port. We, we're going through the most dangerous waters now, aren't we, Mr. Pyle? Why do you say that, Matt? Oh, making us wear our life preservers all the time. Not letting us take any clothes off to sleep. Well, that's just a precaution. Mr. Pyle, you... You know a lot, don't you? <laughs> that's open to a great deal of question. I mean, you've been so many places, done so many things. Most of us are just out of school. What I'm trying to say is, could I ask you a personal question? Go ahead. Well, after all your experience and everything, right now, are you scared? I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then the landing in North Africa. Lieutenant Kenny of Baltimore. I remember his name and his face. Yes, I remember after we were in Oran and everything was settled down to some extent, Lieutenant Kenny found this old broken-down motorbike he had, and he began to, began to make excursions around the country. And one day, out there in the desert, he passed a monstrous-looking lizard lying right there in the pavement. It was about a foot and a half long, a horrible thing, evil-looking enough to be a member of the Nazi party. Well... Kenny poked at it with his shoe, but it didn't attack him. And when he put down his hand, you see this thing crawled up on his arm and over his shoulder, and it sat down on the top of his cap. So with that horrible lizard sitting on the top of his head, Kenny rode back to camp. Lieutenant, the captain's been looking for you. He said as soon as you got back, you should all... Oh! Is there something wrong, Sergeant? the top sitting on your head and it's sitting a thing and it was such it, it, it speak clearly sergeant what's on your mind your head say teeth I think gout don't move guard help corporal of the guard corporal of the guard <laughs> remember Johnny Ebert of St. Petersburg, Florida, 23-year-old staff sergeant mechanic. And the sergeant was waiting at the edge of a runway while the flying fortresses came in from a bombing mission over Tripoli. Now, ten had gone out, nine had come back, and the missing fort was Johnny's ship. And the ten men were Johnny's friends that were in it. The official report was that, that they'd been shot down, but Johnny, he, he kept standing there, and suddenly there was a red flare in the sky, and Johnny's fort was coming in. Two engines dead, the wings no high on the treetops, but coming in and standing there, Johnny was bringing it in. Oh, baby, make it, make it. Just a little higher. Too much. Okay. Now the brakes. The brakes. Oh, thank God, they're out. Slow up, baby. Slow up. Keep away from them hangers. Slow up. Turn. Turn. Come on. Turn. We made it. 
We made it. We made it. We made it. I remember the faces of so many of them. Kids, you know, just kids in the green army, in the air, and on the ground. Against an enemy, it was more experienced, more easily supplied. But an enemy, when the going got tough, that didn't have that American brand of humor to sustain them. Mr. Powell, I wonder, could you help me out? So I know it's raining out, but this is important. It's about this here book. You know, the one they gave us before we got here to Africa. Sixteen pages and mighty neat. Supposed to give a man a liberal education on Africa. But all it does to me, Mr. Powell, is to confuse me. Now you take this here page, quote. Little rainfall is experienced along the coast. Mr. Powell, some Californian must have written that. Because I ask you, man to man, is this here rain falling all over us now, or is it like it says here on page six, quote, an African mirage, unquote. Now, on this page, it says when in the presence of a Muslim, it's very important always to eat with your right hand. But, Mr. Powell, I'm a southpaw. Do they want me to starve to death? And look at this page. It says, talk Arabic to the people. No matter how badly you do it, they like it. Mr. Powell, that's a downright Yankee lie. Mr. Powell, do you know what a man has to say in Arabic just to say good night? Listen. Lail tak cedar, a tan sick bay here. It's just good night. And then this book says that some Arabic sounds are impossible for Americans to learn. It says that K-H-N is the sound made when clearing the throat. And that G-H-N is a deep, gurgling noise. Mr. Paul, I've been studying this Arabic now for three days, and listen to what I got. Achoo! <coughs> that, Mr. Paul, means I love you, baby. Meet me in front of Walgreens right after supper, and leave your veil at home. I remember Major Quint Quick as a bomber squadron leader from Bellingham, Washington. He was looking over a six-week-old copy of an American uh, picture magazine, the latest to reaches. And this uh, magazine was full of photos and stories of the drama of war. You know something, Ernie? I looked at this magazine from back home and... War seems romantic and exciting, full of heroics. I don't think it is at all. I think war is men suffering, wishing they were somewhere else. Men in little routine jobs just behind the lines, belly aching because they can't get to the front. No women to be heroes in front of. Last a little wine to drink. Very little singing or fun. Cold and dirty. Working from day to day in a world full of insecurity and discomfort, homesickness and danger. And I think this war will be romantic to me only twice. Once when I see the Statue of Liberty again. And again on my first day back in my hometown with my folks. But Ned Harris, giving a lecture to a grinning group of his buddies, was on the miracle of the sulfonilamide tablets each soldier carried in the battle. Quiet, fellas, quiet. Now, gentlemen, don't get the idea that these muffamulami, uh, I mean these sulfonilamide, uh, I mean these snuffalulami, uh, these tablets are only good for wounds sustained in battle. 
Gentlemen, nothing could be further from the truth. With a small sum of 25 cents, the whole part of a dollar, I will personally give you a secret formula given me by a cigar store Indian, which mixed with your personal self for tablet and rubbed well into your scalp, is positively guaranteed to make your head as smooth as a billiard ball, kill the hair down to the roots and save you the cost of haircuts for the rest of your life. Leaving you a net profit of $4,832, for which will somebody please loan me two bits so I can go over to PX and get myself a beer. I remember the faces of our men we were overrun before we knew what was happening. We were all on our own. Too many of them for us. Came too fast. We were dive bombed all the way back. All the way back. You see, it was this way, Mr. Pyle. I looked up and there was a Mark IV tank just a hundred yards away. The turret door was open and the German was standing there looking at me, cold as ice. I swung the jeep around and there was another Mark IV. Everywhere I turned, there were German tanks. It was crazy. As if the whole world was suddenly filled with German tanks. Nothing but German tanks. It was this way, Mr. Pyle. Everything was so new and strange. When we walked, we kept falling into holes, into the gullies and the creeks. All the time, it was as if we were blindfolded. Night was so dark. All around us were mines. Every step of mine. That was the worst, Mr. Pyle. The mines. When the retreating was over and the final advance began, I remember the face of a soldier by the campfire. All the moonlight's there tonight along the wall. Singing a song to me was because someone had told him that I was a Hoosier like he was. I remember a foxhole in the hills of Matua and a face of Private Stacy Adams, who's formerly of Park Avenue, New York. I'd like to give you my theory about personal hygiene, or to be more specific, baths. Mr. Pyle, for 21 years, I made it a solemn ritual to take a bath or a shower every single day. Yes, sir? With soap and water. And, may I whisper, bubble bath. I massage my skin daily, and twice on warm days, in the youthful delusion that therein lay the secret of good health. Mr. Pyle, I was wrong. I have been here in North Africa, man and boy, for six months now. And I am now the healthiest man and boy I have ever been. Why? I will tell you. Mr. Pyle, I now take a bath every two months. Yes, sir? Every two months. And I'm thinking seriously of making it once every three months. I, Mr. Pyle, am an emancipated man. I don't bathe. I don't shave. And I go weeks without taking my socks off. And that's the way it is with all my buddies in our tent. Uh, by the way, Mr. Pyle, when you go to Oran, would you mind seeing if you could buy me a large bottle of perfume? Cheap? I remember the faces of a rest camp. After four days and four nights of continuous fighting up a ridge inhabited by snakes and lizards and scorpions and centipedes and nassies, the command had come for the division to take a two days rest. Just think, Ernie, two whole days. Two whole days of this lying in the sun and eating hot chow. Mister, this is living. Isn't that sunshine something? We've been fighting so much in the dark, I was beginning to think that sunlight was only a rumor, like the war was going to be over like Christmas. Yes, sir. This is living. Two whole days. You know, sometimes after one of those stukas gets through dive bombing or an 88 just misses me, sometimes I just lie there taking deep breaths and enjoy myself, just breathing. 
Can you beat that, Mr. Pyle? I enjoy just breathing. And now I got two whole days. Uh, did you ever see a bluer sky than this back in New Mexico, Ernie? Oh, I'm going to lie here flat on my back for the rest of these 45 hours and just look up at that sky. Ernie, what do you think of my division? Good team, eh? They know their job and they're doing it well. I only hope I'll be there to command them when we move over to the continent. Ernie, uh, you may be moving on, so I'd like to say something to you now because, uh, well, maybe you'll think about it and write about it. You've written so much about the ordinary foot soldier in this war. And what I'm going to say now is all for the G.I. Joe who carries the load. Ernie, uh, this infantry division of mine, their skill and their devotion to duty and their willingness to sacrifice personally for the sake of the rest, is all that going to pieces once it's over? Oh, I'm not talking about international cooperation or anything as large as that. I'm talking about these men and their personal relations to each other. Are they going to be forced back into a social and economic life that considers personal sacrifice and cooperation necessary only for war or, or football? Aren't they going to get a chance to practice a few of those virtues in their business life, in their relations to government? Is war always going to be the only unifying force for the best in our men? Is this... Yes, sir. Huh? Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Oh, no. Oh, it's bad news, Ernie. We've got to move out right away. Hill 56 has got to be taken by midnight. Oh, those poor guys. Two hours rest in four days. <laughs> poor guys, those brave guys, the infantry, the God-forsaken infantry, the mud, rain, frost, and wind boys of the infantry, dear God, how many miles I'm away from them in time and space since Tanir, and yet that's, that's what I remember best, the faces of the infantry. Long, thin line of them. Four days and nights they'd fought. And now, you know, they were moving forward again. Their clothes torn from crawling over rocks. Cut and scratched and bleeding. But moving forward. On their shoulders and backs, they carried machine gun barrels and leaden boxes of ammunition. Their feet, their feet seemed to sink in the ground. But they were moving forward. One long, tired line of guys from, from Main Street to Broadway. No tonic of victory in them. No excitement. No despair. Just moving on to do the job. I remember. I think we can move on now, Mr. Pyle. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> Mr. Pyle, there's still one thing I don't quite get. What's that? Well, all the time you were telling about your experiences in North Africa, I was thinking of all the places you've been and all the chances you've taken. Oh, I, I try not to take any foolish chances. There's just no way to play it completely safe and still do your job. Yeah, I guess that's right. But in a way, you, you are right, you know. I, I just about used up the law of average. <laughs> it's not that I have a premonition that death's going to catch up with me. It's just the feeling that every infantryman in the line finally gets. You begin to think that you've used up your good luck. I feel that way. And I hate it. I don't want to get killed. I want to go home. Lie in the grass in the backyard. Tell all the neighborhood kids about my narrow escapes. Yes, sir. Mr. Pyle. What is it, Lieutenant? In that brush up ahead, something moved. He said there were no Japs. Come on. We better get out. That ditch. Hi. Mr. Pyle. Mr. Pyle. Your 
have just heard Mr. Burgess Meredith in Mr. Pyle, a new play by Arch Oveler. Included in the cast with Mr. Meredith were Frank Martin, Sidney Miller, David Bradford, Bruce Elliott, Everett Allen, Bob Holton, Herbert Rawlinson, Bill Shaw, and your announcer, Marvin Best. The orchestra was conducted by David Raxon. Sound, Jack Snell with Bill James. Engineer, Misha Peltz. Tonight's play was presented through the cooperation of Lester Cowan Productions, producers of Ernie Pyle's story of G.I. Joe. And now, Burgess Meredith has something to say to you. Some of the G.I. Joes whom Ernie Pyle loved and wrote about are coming home. Those are words filled with responsibility for all of us. So I'd like to read you Eve Merriman's poem about the returning soldier. Peace is coming home at last. After the screamingly silent months, how shall we greet him? What leaping words will span the arch of war? He was such a boy when he left, and so much has happened since he went away. It seems as though we hardly knew him at all. Who in that corner whispering, perhaps we never did. Hooray! His train is slowing down. Quick, quick, the wreath, the roses, the mayor, the pretty girls, the band beaming, self-conscious Sunday clothes, and everybody sing! Oh, my God. His head is bloody. And his feet, his foot... Dear God, how can we bear to look at him? Peace, the penny hero, sheep common, millions like him, stumping along in his ragged uniform, khaki crude color of earth. Do not dare to turn away, and do not take him in to pity him. Give him work to do, great warring work that peace can do, for things that shall be common as bread and salt. I pray you, go with peace and give him work to do. Next week, the play will be The Naked Mountain, a new melodrama with Mr. Franco Tone and Mr. June Dupre in the leading roles. This will be the 11th in a special series of plays written, produced, and directed for the Mutual Broadcasting System by Arch Obler. Listen to Freedom of Opportunity tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime over most of these stations for a dramatization of the complete life story of Ernie Pyle. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things. For I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. The Other Hand. As he turned the brass knob of the heavy oaken door and stepped into the lobby, Clint Markham realized that the doctor was right. That now, with final proofs okayed on Clint's first big series of articles for the magazine, he needed complete rest and quiet. And Oakdale Sanitarium was the place to get it. The day's supervisor, 
A scrub-looking gray-haired woman in an immaculate white uniform was talking on the telephone behind the counter as he entered. Yes, Doctor, we have everything ready for him. That's right. The first floor room in the east wing looking out on the garden. We'll have complete quiet. I... Oh, just a moment, please. Yes, sir. I'm St. Markham. Oh, Mr. Markham. I'm talking to Dr. Grosvenor on the phone right now. Uh, the doctor would like to speak to you, Mr. Markham. Here. Thank you. Hello, Doctor. Clint, glad you showed up. Thought for a while you weren't going to be sensible. I know when I'm late. I woke this morning tied up in a hard knot. Well, you've got a bad stomach there, Clint. Might easily turn into something serious. I know. I've given the complete instructions here. I have absolute quiet for a week. Longer, if possible. That means no business, no interruptions of any kind. Right. Now, you've got to cooperate with this, you know. I'm aware of that. I hope you are. Well, that's it, Clint. Good luck. Thanks. Goodbye, Doctor. That's it. I suppose the entire staff is completely informed on my situation. Well, Dr. Grosvenor was rather explicit. I thought so. I suppose you show me to my private cell, huh? I'm sorry, nurse. I can't eat a bite of this dinner. You've got the first day jitters. It'll take you a little time to relax. And what about calls? Anyone phone me this afternoon? Well, we've had instructions. Oh, not... come on now. Who was it? Um, uh, Miss Susan Forrest. Uh-huh. Uh, what did you say? She said at nine tonight she'd be at a little place called Rodolfo's at 8th and Greenway. I explained, of course, that you couldn't be there. Oh, uh, good. She, uh, she needs to be told no once in a while. Uh, take this tray away, will you? I think I'll try and sleep. You're being very sensible, Mr. Markham. I'll leave this sleeping pill for you. I don't want to be disturbed under any circumstances until tomorrow morning. Uh, take care of that, will you? Of course. Good night, Mr. Markham. Good night. The minutes tick by as you lie in the quiet darkness. Telling yourself how ridiculous it was of Susan to expect you to leave the sanitarium and meet her. But you finally decide you can't dismiss her like that. Yes, Clint. Susan's not only an exciting girl, but a very important one at the moment. And sanitarium or no, she likes to have her way. You decide that it would be best to see her. At 8.30, you're back in your clothes. Thankful you were given a room on the first floor. And to avoid an argument in the lobby... You leave by the French windows leading out through the garden to the street beyond. Taxi! Rodolfo, 8th and Greenway. I didn't expect to see you here, Lenore. I expected to see you. Sit down. I'm sorry I have an appointment. Susan Forrest will be late. She always is. How did you know? Miss Forrest will stop by the office to find out where you were. She called the hospital from there. Waiter. Yes, ma'am. Terrible fashion, please. Sit down, Clint. Surely you've a moment to spare for your loyal and loving secretary. Uh, look, Lenore, there's no point in hacking it all over again. You've got to understand I that I'm... I know, darling, you're a sick man. Getting the articles in shape, making the right deal with just the right publisher has been tough. We're going to be just good friends from now on. Let's not be sarcastic. I was great as a pal and buddy until Susie came along. The little gal with a big punch. Why don't you be honest? I, 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 I tried to be. The only thing Susan Forrest has got that I haven't is a father who runs a successful magazine. Why don't you admit it? I don't want to discuss it, that's all. I wish you would. But why? Why should we go? Don't you see what a fool she's making of you? No, I don't. Oh. Besides, what does that have to do with us? That's why I came here tonight. I want an answer. Well, what kind of an answer do you want? About you and me. I've already told you. That's final? Yes, Lenore. You're sure? Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, Trent. Sorry you decided this way. And what does that mean? I don't think you know me very well, Clint. Not really. I fight for what I want. And if I lose, I might as well warn you. I don't give up gracefully. If you're thinking of exposing me, I might as well tell you nobody's going to believe that you wrote most of those articles. Besides... <laughs> Too old-fashioned. Oh, uh, 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 thanks. Here you are. Thank you, sir. Well? 
I should have known it would be this way. My mother ran to railroad men. I run to heel. I think I've been fair enough with you. Fair? The articles were my idea. I worked them out. Frankly, I didn't expect to see like this. I thought we understood each other. You've been given a fair salary, and after all, we're adults. Don't worry. I'm not going to jump off a bridge yet. Well, I should hope not. It's a hard problem, but there are answers, you know. I started to tell you, Lenore, threatening to expose me won't work. Mm -hmm. Looking for a cigarette? I seem to be out. You need one. You're shaking like a model tea. Here, have one of mine. No. No. Right? Thanks. All right. Hello. Oh, Flash bulb. Oh. Talk with her. Uh, just caught your picture, folks. Have it ready for you in about ten minutes. Four by six prints for a dollar. Uh, not now. And... I don't want any souvenirs of this. Um, is this my drink? Yes. Go on, Clint. I, I would finish your drink and we'll order another. Whew. No, thanks. No more. With this stomach of mine, I've lost my taste for liquor. Besides, that one will give me a little trouble. Uh, about the picture... Please, go away. I said not tonight. Excuse me, Lenore. I'll go over and get some cigarettes. But it's not the cigarettes, is it, Clint? You have to get away from Lenore for a moment to think. As you fumble with the levers on the cigarette machine... You glance in the mirror on the front of it and see yourself there, white-faced, beads of perspiration standing out in your forehead. You realize she knows you were bluffing, that she can tell just by looking at you. Yes, Lenore can ruin you and she knows it. Somehow, you've got to come to terms with her. As you start to return to the table... Oh. Oh. Going to soon, Lenore? Well, yes, I... I... I, I've got to run, Clint. Well, let me take you. No, you'd better wait for Miss Forrester. I insist, Lenore. We, uh, we have a little more talking to do, you know. Come on. Boss in orders. I don't see why you have to come in. I told you. You Clint. haven't told me a thing. I'm not a blackmailer. I'm not interested in anything but you. Is that clear? Sure, only I just don't believe it. Well, will you please go? My roommate will be coming home soon. I don't want it to... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Come on. Oh. Not now. Can't discuss it. No. All right, later. <laughs> just interested in me. Huh? Oh, Clint, this... I'm through this. That was Marty Davis, wasn't it? Leg man for that newspaper columnist. What's he paying you for the exposure picture? Well, Clint... Literary thoughts come pretty high, Lenore. I take it you haven't given him everything yet, or he wouldn't be calling back. Haven't named names yet. Please. No, I haven't named names. I've heard... I heard what you said. But I told you once it won't work, and I meant... I'm not telling anyone about you. Not the papers, not Susan Forrester. I don't have to. Now, just get out of here, please. Oh, no, I'm not leaving until You I... are leaving right now. Put that down. You... Give me that. Let go! Why ruin me, will you? You... you... No. The next few minutes are a blank. Impressions, visions, images, colors swirling up like a whirlpool in your mind. Then your head clears. You find yourself moving mechanically, wiping your fingerprints from the heavy candlestick. Later, you find yourself running blindly down a darkened street. You remember the sanitarium, the open French doors, the room you can return to without being missed. The one way out. A moment later, you're climbing in a cab. And as the driver pulls away from the curb, you try and calm yourself. Stop the blood from pounding in your brain. Still the agonizing pain in your stomach. You're sure there's no way they can connect your being with her tonight. No one could possibly have recognized you together. Your eye wanders to the back of the cab seat, the driver's license, his picture. Then everything freezes inside you as you remember something. Stop! Uh, stop, stop, stop the car. I forgot something. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Uh, do I wait for you? Oh, uh, uh, no. Here, here you are. Uh, keep the change. Uh. You hurry back to Rodolfo's. 
Your mind focused on the thing you forgot. The one thing that can hang. That photographer. I've got to get that picture. Since only 13 shopping days remain until Christmas, I have a brilliant last-minute idea. <laughs> There's no finer present than a switch for that forgotten name on your gift list. The forgotten name I'm referring to is your car, and the switch I'm suggesting is a switch to Signal. You'll all agree, I'm sure, that Signal must have something to have grown so in popularity from a small start in Southern California into an organization of independent dealers serving seven Pacific Coast states from Canada to Mexico. You also know about Signal's good mileage that has made it known as the go-farther gasoline. But even more important to motorists is the extra driving pleasure you enjoy, because today's Signal gasoline helps your engine run so efficiently. So if you want your gas pedal to keep that Christmas morning thrill year-round, how about following Marvin Miller's suggestion? How about giving your car a switch for Christmas? A switch to Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. You've killed your secretary, Lenore, haven't you? It doesn't matter now that you didn't mean to kill her. The terrible and important fact is that she's dead, where you left her on the floor of her apartment. And you realize the only thing that can save you is an ironclad statement from the authorities at Oakdale Sanitarium that you were in your room asleep at the time of Lenore's death. And it would be so simple, Clint, if it weren't for one little thing. The fact that a nightclub photographer took a notion to snap a picture of the two of you together. And only half an hour before Lenore died. You fight your way through the crowds on Greenway Street to Rodolfo. Hesitate a moment in the lobby entrance, realizing that you mustn't be seen. Then you step into one of the several phone booths. Look up Rodolfo's number, dial it. Then a moment later, a girl at the cashier's desk, whom you can see easily from your position in the phone booth, picks up her phone. Rodolfo's restaurant. Uh, miss, I-, I wonder if I could talk to the chap who takes the pictures? Yes. Hold the phone a minute, sir. I'll see if he's around. Oh, thank you. You watch from the phone booth as the girl leaves the desk to look for the photographer. You open the door of the warm booth slightly. Mop your forehead as you sit there waiting. I don't understand. Suddenly you hear a voice, a very familiar voice, about 20 feet away. You're absolutely certain that Mr. Martin hasn't been here. Uh, no one is up for you, Miss Butler. I've been right here. I hope I didn't miss him by waiting in the bar. Susan Forrester, coming directly towards you. You draw back into the booth, keeping the door partially open, so the light will remain off of you as Susan stops so close by you could reach out and touch her. He's never kept me waiting like this before. It's been a half hour. Well, I do not know the gentleman, madam, but... Oh, I wonder if he's out my message. Where's the telephone? Right here. Oh, uh, someone's in the first seat. Uh, please sit on, madam. Thank you. You withdraw further into the booth next to the one Susan is using. Even here are dialing as you anxiously watch the cashier's desk. Then prepare to listen to the conversation you can't prevent, knowing that if they send someone to your room at the sanitarium, you're in a hopeless position. Hello. Hello, Oakdale. This is Miss Forrester calling again. I left a message earlier in the evening for Mr. Martin. Yes, yes, that's right. No, I don't wish to leave another message. I'd like to talk to him. What? You have to get permission. Oh, well, when will the night supervisor be back? Oh, Fifteen minutes. All right, I'll call back in fifteen minutes. You hear her hang up. Look out cautiously as she moves past you on her way back to the cocktail lounge. Finally, the girl from the cashier's desk comes back, picks up her phone. You might as well be blocks away as you talk to him. Hello, sir? Uh, yes? I'm sorry, but Ted, our photographer, he's left for the evening. Oh? There's a chance you might find him around the corner at Leonardi's. His girlfriend works there. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. You hang up in a blind panic, wondering about your next move. 
In 15 minutes, Susan will call the sanitarium, talk to the night supervisor. She's a persistent girl, Susan, used to getting her own way. But somehow you've got to stop her call. And then you realize that the answer might be right in front of you. Worth a try, isn't it, Chris? Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Clint Markham. Yes, sir? I was to meet a young lady there, a Miss Susan Forrester. Uh, would you pay the phone, please? Just a moment. Uh, you might try the cocktail lounge. Yes, sir. You wait anxiously, and then smile as you see Susan crossing from the cocktail lounge to the cashier's desk, such a very short distance from her. She picks up the phone. Hello? Hello, Susan. Clint, where are you? Well, at the sanitarium, dear. But I left a message hours ago. Didn't you get it? Miss Susan... They are very narrow-minded here. They insist that the patients obey doctor's orders. Oh, you're as well as I am. Uh, Dr. Grosvenor doesn't do so. He tells me I've got to rest. Clint, I wanted to see you. Well, I want to see you. But perhaps there's something in what they say, you know, the strain of finishing the writing and all. Oh, that's ridiculous. Why, well, you're as healthy as Look, dear, look. Let's put up with them for a few days, huh? We'll make up for it. Well, uh, me... You know I do. I'll call you the very first day they allow me to visit. All right. But don't keep me waiting too long, darling. I won't. Good night, dear. Good night. There's still a chance, Clint. One more call now. You look up the number quickly. J-K-L-L. Leon. Leonard. Leonardi. Hello, hello. Is is Ted, the photographer from Rodolfo's there? Ted? Sure, he's here. Who oh, could I could I talk to him, please? Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if he's all talked out. His girlfriend gave him the bounce tonight. Please, put put him on. Okay. You're shaking, aren't you, Clint, with nervousness and anxiety. You've got to make it quick. Find out about the picture. Get it and the negative. Get back to the sanitarium without being seen by anyone who could link you with Lenore's death. Finally, you hear the voice of the photographer. Oh, what do you want? Ted? Yeah, this is Ted. Well, look, Ted, I- I'm in a hurry and... It... Well, go on. No, 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 listen. You took a picture tonight at Rodolfo's, a girl who... Oh, yeah, that's how my little Julianne made the grade. With a picture I took. She showed it to the head of a model. Agency. Please, please, I'm, I'm not talking about your girl. This was at Rodolfo's earlier, a blonde girl. Oh, oh the blonde. Mister, you shouldn't trust her. I don't remember you, but I sure remember that blonde girl. She gave me the surprise of my life. She gave me 20 bucks for the picture and the negative. What? 20 bucks. I delivered them to her apartment. You delivered them to her? Yeah, I shoved them under her apartment door. A little double cross. <laughs> now you're talking, mister. Now you're smart. All women are double crossers. I don't know you, buddy, but you come on down here, huh? We'll have a little drink on it, huh? No. Thank you, I can't. I have things to do. Yes, Clint, you have got things to do. The most important is get that picture in negative. You ease out of the phone booth, slip out of Rodolfo's without being noticed. Twenty minutes later, you're back at Lenore's apartment, racing up the stairs. You gasp with relief at the sight of a large brown envelope stuck under her door. As you scoop it up and put it in your pocket, you hear someone coming up the stairs. There's just time to leap back into an alcove out of sight. Oh, don't be silly, friend. Is that right? I want you to come in and meet Lenore in my room, babe. She must be quite a power if you can barge in like this. Oh, that is a great power, but she's out of bed she's completely gone in that voice of hers. Here we go, my dad. As they enter the apartment, you slip from the alcove and dash down the hall. At the head of the stairs, it comes. Not until you're several blocks away and safe in a cab do you slide the picture from its envelope, glance at it in the dim light. Makes you tremble a little, doesn't it, Chris? 
sets off the nervous stomach. Lenore, alive only a few hours ago, reaching over to light your cigarette. Seems years now. Uh, you uh, say you want out at the hunt and test stream, mister? That's right. I'll walk the rest of the way. You leave the cab several blocks from the sanitarium and wait until it drives off. No one notices you in the darkness as you climb across the terrace. Let yourself in through the French window. A few minutes later, you're undressed, back in bed. For the first time now, you're aware of thirst, a raging thirst. You lean back, trembling. The reaction is setting in, isn't it, Clint? The letdown after the terror of the past few hours. You wish you could try to forget it now, but there's one more thing. One more act you must put out. Your hand trembles as you reach for the signal cord to summon the nurse. Your head throbs. The tight, knotted feeling in your stomach is worse than ever. You steel yourself for the next few moments ahead. Really, for me, Mr. Martin? Yes. Put on a light. Are you a nurse? Oh. Right. Probably right. Oh, how long have I been asleep? After one o'clock. Oh. Um, anyone try to reach me? I believe there was a call, but the night supervisor... He wouldn't let them through. It's the only way, Mr. Markham. You need your rest. You don't look too well. Uh, I, I don't feel well, nurse. Is there anything you wanted? Yes, I'm... I'm terribly thirsty. Did I have a glass of water? Yes, I'll get it for you. And then you'll have to go back to sleep. I will, nurse. I'll be right back. Uh, uh. While watching some Christmas shoppers the other day, I couldn't help feeling it's too bad folks aren't as careful in selecting their motor oil as they are in selecting Christmas gifts. If they were, a lot more motorists would switch to New Signal Premium, the heavy-duty type motor oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. Just think what a 50% reduction in engine wear can mean to your car's performance and your budget. By reducing engine wear 50%, New Signal Premium should help your car keep its light new pep and power twice as long. By reducing engine wear 50%, New Signal Premium should help your car go twice as far before needing an expensive engine overhaul. Yet in the face of increasing costs, these important benefits are yours to enjoy at no increase in price at Signal Service Station. Aren't those reasons of plenty to decide right now to get your next oil change at a Signal Station? Get it changed to New Signal Premium, the heavy-duty type Signal Motor Oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication, 50%. So it's over now, Clint, and you're back in your bed at the sanitarium. You're certain that Susan, the nurse and attendant, all believe you've been in your room all evening. You're weak and trembling, your stomach worse than ever. But you can lean back, relax now, and rest, quite sure that you're safe. You're certain no one knows you left the room. The only thing that can still connect you to the murder of Lenore Stark is the picture of the two of you taken at Rodolfo, the picture in negative in the brown envelope lying on the stand beside your bed. You waver dizzily as you reach for them, slide them from the envelope, strike a match. The negative goes up in flames quickly. Then you touch the match to the upper left corner of the picture. The glossy print starts to burn, the flames moving down, crawling across the picture of your face. And then Lenore, finally down to her hand, holding a match to your cigarette. That's when you see it, Clint. Something you should have seen before. Her other hand, her left hand poised directly over your drink, dropping a capsule into it. No wonder... Oh, wonder she wanted the picture. I'm not telling anyone. I don't have to. The flame becomes a blur, Clint. The cloud engulfs you. The walls of the room and the bed draw away, fading, fading. I brought you 
brought your water, Mr. Markham. Mr. Markham, did you fall asleep? Water. No. Water. What is it, Mr. Markham? Is something wrong? Mr. Markham? No. It's too late. Mr. Markham, you've got to try. You've got to sit up. Please, Mr. Markham, please. I came back with the water, Doctor. I found that Mr. Markham had fainted. I tried to rouse him. It's but... all right, nurse. You couldn't do anything for him. <sighs> I don't understand it. He's dead. Yes. And judging from his color and expression, I think we'll find it was some sort of slow-acting poison. But there isn't any poison here. Where in the world could he have gotten it, Doctor? Why, he hasn't put his foot out of this room all night. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you, during this busy pre-holiday season, it's especially important to drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations so that some avoidable accident doesn't mar your Merry Christmas. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Ted Osborne, Betty Lou Gerson, Monty Margett, G.G. Pearson, Jerry Hausner, and Ted Von Elf. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone and Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on the Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by the Whistler entitled Curiosity Killed a Cat, in which greed and desire set off a murder on the high seas, resulting in a daring flight through a storm by the killer. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, a package of cigarettes, a length of string... A linen napkin. All are touched by murder. There's a Gladstone bag. It's a familiar object. Every railroad train carries several. Inevitably useful, compact, and expandable. They always hold more than they seem. They're perfect for vacation. Perfect also for... If you look inside, Inspector, just uh, try the two halves apart at one end, as I did. Yes, I see. Well, all objects to have in a valise... Not if one had every intention of disposing of them, Inspector. Today, that Gladstone bag can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death. The Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. <laughs>
Now, the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. And here we are, in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Mausoleum of Murder. At a time, this is I open this door, you know, and I feel the old familiar inscription should be carved on a lintel. Abandon hope for he who enter here. Yes, abandon hope of peaceful, quiet, dreamless sleep. For within this room is almost every instrument which ever has been used for the commission of the foul deed called murder. Yes, here lies death. No doubt about it. You feel it in the dull, oppressive atmosphere. You see it first marked calmly on the neatly lettered cards. So-and-so died by this instrument at the hands of so-and-so, dated, and so forth. Your glance passes to the thing itself. You almost feel the blood. There's a camera. So, you think... Ordinary you know... tourist snapshot-taking camera. Yet within the blackness of this box, the film registered two faces. A third person saw a print. And from that recognition, three people died... One by a hangman's rope. Here's a briar pipe, well smoked, thoroughly discolored, a pleasure to a pipe smoker, but no pleasure to the man who inhales hydrocyanic gas with his tobacco. Nor to the killer, trapped by the pipe itself. Ah, here we are, the Gladstone bag. Piece of luggage for a man. It looks so commonplace, so much as if it belonged to a traveling salesman, not to Jim Hudson. Of course, in a way, Jim was a traveling salesman. He certainly had a sales talk. And he was quite successful at it. Sally, I've never seen you looking lovelier. Oh, Jimmy, you always do that. Do what, sweetheart? Say things like that, just when I want to pick a fight with you. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I love you so much. Despite your wife and everything else. Everything else? That's what I wanted to fight with you about. We... Well, we just can't go on like this, Jimmy, darling. Why not? We're as happy as seconds. Don't you see, Jimmy? A woman wants at least a snatch of domesticity, not just clandestine meetings with the clock ticking away her happiness in the background. It'll come, darling. It'll come. The girl was right, of course, from her point of view. Granted that the relationship between her and the man she loved was... Well, outside the recognized bounds. Granted that they found each other when it seemed too late. Still, the girl was right. She wanted a certain sense of security, which can come to a woman only through the small things of making coffee in the morning while a man was shaving with an earshot. And Sally James was the kind of girl who took action when she wanted something badly enough. Jim, what about the week we planned together for this spring? I probably could get away, darling, if we had a place to go. I have the place... Anyway, the ad about it. You are something, aren't you? Here, darling. I found this in the Sunday paper. Go on, read it. For rent. Bungalow. The beaches. Pevensey Bay, Eastbourne. Reasonable by the week. You've got your heart set on this, haven't you, sweet? Can we do it? A week of April 12th. All right? All right. Oh, Jimmy... It'll be heaven down there by the sea. Heaven by the sea. Poor girl, one of those human beings who believes with all her heart that dreams can become reality. Perhaps it was just as well that Sally didn't see her Jim some two evenings later in a quiet little restaurant not more than three blocks from the place she'd given Jim her precious clippings. Rhoda, my darling, I've never seen you looking lovelier. Oh, come off it, Jimmy. That kind of romance and just isn't in my style. You're a woman, aren't you? Well, you ought to know, Jimmy boy. <laughs> and how? Thanks. Look, Rhoda, I've taken a cottage at Pevensey Bay. Oh, how inconvenient to have to travel all that distance. Not for weekends, it isn't. Inconvenient. Well, the daring young man on the flying trapeze. <laughs> Would you like weekends by the sea, Rhoda? Why not? I think it's fun. Nice place. Called the Beaches. Old garden, private bathing beach. Sounds marvelous. I thought you'd like it. Well, I can't make it this weekend. Neither can I. How about the weekend of the 16th? 
We'd go down Friday afternoon, come back early Monday morning. There's a very early train. It's a deal, Jim. It really is a deal. A clever rascal, Jim Hudson, without a doubt. Knows his way with the ladies. But he cuts his margins rather close, doesn't he? Not the dates. April 12th, the week, with Sally. Friday the 16th, with Rhoda. Well, it's hardly a full week with Sally. But, of course, Sally doesn't know about this on Friday noon the 9th as she stands in the doorway of the railway carriage in Waterloo Station. You will be down by Monday, won't you, Jimmy, dear? Sooner than that, if I can. You know that, darling. I guess I feel like a little girl on her first trip home. I'm sorry it has to be this way. Oh, I don't mind, really. I'll have a chance to put the cottage in shape. Have it all clean and comfortable for my man. When I saw it, there weren't any tools there. And there's always something to fix. I'd better add tools to my shopping list. Oh, and don't forget the traveling eye I asked you for, dear. And please hurry to get down and... Oh, kiss me. Quick, Jimmy, the train's leaving. Oh, Jimmy, dearest. Bye, darling. See you Monday. Monday it'll be. Take care, darling. Take care. Watching as he walks up the platform. The train is already disappearing from the track. Jim has his hands in his pockets. He's whistling merrily. A man with nothing on his mind except his love affair and the prospect of the week ahead. He leaves the station, walks up the street a ways, pauses before a hard wish. What was it he added to his shopping list? Oh, yes. Tools. He enters the shop. May I assist you, sir? Yes, yes, I think you can. What do you wish? Uh, you've got some fine-looking knives in the window. May I see them? Any particular blade size up? I think, um, yes, yes, the ten-inch carver will be about right. Uh, very well, sir. There we are, sir. Best Sheffield steel, hollow ground, razor sharp, and guaranteed to hold temper. It will take very little honing to keep the edge, sir. Mm, very efficient-looking. Uh, do you prefer the bone or the plastic handle? Bone, I think. Uh, very good, sir. Is there anything else? I think, um, yes, sir. A small cross-cut saw. Small, about uh, 18 inches. Perfect. Excellent quality, as you can hear. Good. Would you wrap them, please? Again, that will be six and four, sir. I'll just make up the slip. You'll have your package in a moment. Jim Hudson took his package on the train with him on Monday morning. And tea time at the beaches, Pevensey Bay, promised to be exciting. And wonderful. Isn't this wonderful, Jimmy? I discovered the past was at the top of the cliff on Sunday. Oh, Jimmy, it's paradise. It is a nice view. And so alone, so private. This is our private view, darling. It's it's like a honeymoon. You are a sweet little thing, Sally. That is. I know. When you call me sweet, you think of me as a child. But I love you as a woman, Jimmy. I know. Shall we go back now? It looks like it may kick up a storm. If you want to, darling. Whatever you want. Whatever he wants, Sally. But does he know what he wants, this man with a wife in London, you at the beaches, and still a third woman waiting to join him just four days from now? It's too bad the beach isn't sand. Oh, I don't know. Shale isn't bad. Funny about this place. Funny? How, darling? Do you remember the Doris Clark case? Who was she? She's the reason the beaches was available. I don't understand. She lived here. Two men she knew came down. She was beaten. Buried alive in the shale. The men hung. How horrible. They made a lot of mistakes, or they mightn't have been caught. People shy away from a house with that kind of a story. I don't care. We'll change its reputation then, with our love. Let's go inside, dear. It's getting chilly with the sun gone and the storm coming up. The storm came, the rain pounded on the roof, the wind lashed at the sea. And within the cottage called the beaches, all was snug and warm. I love a fire in a fireplace. Don't you, Jimmy, darling? Yes, I suppose I do. Oh, Jim. Am I being too sticky? Sentimental? Trifle. 
What's wrong, Jimmy? He's been, well, far away today. Sally, let's face it. Things like this never go on for long. Jim! Jimmy, I don't believe you said that. I did say it. I mean it. Then why did you bring me down here? It was your idea. I went along with it, hoping we could work something out. Work it out? It's past the... You just... You never loved me. Stop crying. I can't stand crying. I ruined my life for you. Now you want to just forget about me. Stop it. Go on. You can't be infantile forever. You want your cake and to have it too. You want your wife and other women. You won't. I won't let you. Stop it, Sally. I told you to stop it. No. No, I didn't do it. I'll do whatever you want. I'll go away and never see you get up. Jim, don't touch me. Jim, please. Jim. Jimmy. Ah! scene was set, save for one vital piece of evidence, a black Gladstone bag, which can be seen today in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. Friday, the 16th of April, dawn fine and clear. A calm, gay Jim Hudson made his way, whistling as usual through the weekend bound crowds of Waterloo Station. Wow. Here you are, my good man. <laughs> Glad you think I'm a good man. <laughs> I am. Uh, well, I think you are. <laughs> By Monday morning, I'll know. <laughs> then let's make that train, baby. Pevensey Bay on number seven. The train to Pevensey Bay was none too fast for Jim and Rhoda. It was a fine spring day. It was a beautiful spring evening. Moonlight made the rollers on the beach gleam with a lovely phosphorescence. On the porch of the cottage, known as the beaches. Know something, Jimmy boy? I know lots of things, old girl. What, for instance? Oh, this. If I were the romantic type, this place would make me go all oh, gooey. But you're not? No, I'm not. All your misconceptions of women notwithstanding... And you want to waste all this moonlight and romance? Oh, come, darling. If you must wish for sweet nothings, come and whisper them. Why not out here? Because I don't feel comfortable on the shale. Come on, now. Always let the woman have her way, particularly after she's cooked a beautiful dinner. Here, now. I'm the only beautiful thing. What a way you have. In here, darling. No, no, not in there. It's a, it's a spare room, not made up. I want to see it. Oh, nothing in there. Oh, are you going to deny me anything, darling? It's locked. I... Uh... Oh, Jimmy. No. Hey, what are you? Bluebeard or something? Maybe I am. <laughs> Oh, 
The door stayed locked. The weekend at Pevensey Bay was quite successful. But now, the scene changes to a London street lined with somewhat shabby buildings which house somewhat shabby offices. Into one of those buildings, a woman hurries almost furtively. She climbs the stairs, one flight, walks into an office, door of which announces in gold lettering, Cross Detective Agency. You are Mr. Cross? I am. What can I do for you, Mrs.... Uh... Mrs.? Uh, oh, my ring. Yes, an old trick. Uh, you sit down, won't you? Thank you. My name is Lillian Hudson. Mrs. Lillian Hudson. I see. Well, how can I help you? I, uh, I want some information on my husband, James Hudson. Go on, please. I saw your advertisement. Were you formerly with Scotland Yard? I was. Advancement seems slow. I'm working for myself now. Yes. Well, I have reason to believe that my husband has been, well, seeing other women. Uh, you want me to get the evidence? I think so. A divorce action? Perhaps. It depends on the results. And you want to stay in the background? For the present. Hmm. Well, have you anything on which I can start? Uh, an address? A uh, lead of any kind? I have this. A baggage check. Waterloo Station baggage storage. Stamp 10 a.m. Friday, April 16th. An innocent bit of baseball. Where did you get this, Mrs. Hudson? I took one of my husband's suits to the cleaner. This was in a pocket. The cleaner gave it to me. Oh, and why should this mean anything? Because Jim, my husband, was away the entire week of the 12th until the morning of the 19th. It came to me, if he had told the truth, how could he have checked something at Waterloo on the 16th if he were out of town all that week? <laughs> An interesting observation, Mrs. Hudson. Well, I suppose I go over to Waterloo Station and pick up whatever was checked there. Oh, and uh, <clears throat> sorry to mention this, but uh, it is customary to have a retainer, you know. Private Detective Cross, once of Scotland Yard, went on over to Waterloo Station and presented the baggage check. A short while later, he arrived in the office of Inspector Henley at the yard. Oh, yes, Cross, I remember you now. Ah, thank you, Inspector. You were with us once, weren't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, there are times, Cross, when I wish I had the gumption to strike out on my own. Too late now, however. And there are times, Inspector, when I wish I'd stayed on here. However... Yes, to each his own, and the grass is always greener, and so on. Well, Sergeant Anderson said you wanted to show me something. Oh, yes, this, sir. This Gladstone bag. Hmm. Looks perfectly normal. Lots, I see. Yes, if you look inside, Inspector, just uh, pry the two halves apart at one end, as I did. Yes, I see. Oh, odd objects to have in a valise. Not if one had every intention of disposing of them, Inspector. Uh, you're probably right about that. Seems like some sook or something. And badly stained. If I were a gambling man, I'd give ten to one the stains of blood, sir. And it wouldn't be much of a gamble. Any ideas on what the metal objects are? Well, I flashed my pen light in there, sir. One is a carving knife, and the other is a carpenter's saw. I see. How did you come into possession of this bag, Cross? And Mrs. Hudson found the check for it in her husband's pocket. She says the cleaner found it. I doubt that. Divorce action, I assume. Correct, sir. I understand. Well, my suggestion is this. We'll give you another stub. Give it to Mrs. Hudson and have her place it in her husband's pocket. When he comes back with the bag, we'll have a man ready to pick him up. It seems to me this little matter bears further investigation. So simple, so quietly effective. Just place a check for baggage in a man's pocket. When he comes to claim his Gladstone bag. Yes, sir. Oh, here's my check. It's a brown Gladstone. Left it three days ago. Just a moment, sir. Sergeant Anderson, sir. Yes? It's the check you've been waiting for. That fellow there, whistling. Thank you. Give him the bag. I'll speak to him. Yes, that's my bag. Oh, that'll be two and six, sir, for overtime storage. Oh, here we are. Thank you, sir. Glad to oblige. Oh, excuse me, sir. Are you James Hudson? That's right. Who are you? Uh, Sergeant Anderson, Scotland Yard. My credentials. If you'd be good enough to come with me. What for? Uh, Inspector Henley would like to see you. He's waiting at the police station, just a block or two from the station here. Well, I've got my bag here. Couldn't it wait tomorrow, or...? Uh, that's all right, Mr. Hudson. I'll carry your bag. <laughs> The 
squad room at the police station near Waterloo was very quiet. Inspector Henley sat behind a battered desk on the desk rested the Gladstone bag open now, and next to it a file, a familiar dossier from the criminal records office. We have your file, as you see, Hudson. I see. Death, burglary, five years for criminal assault. Does your wife know about these things, Hudson? No, she doesn't. I see. Hudson, how do you account for the contents of this bag? I, um, I was butchering half a steer for a friend of mine in the country. He has a deep freeze. Oh, that's rather thin, Hudson. Did you wear a silk dress size 10 to butcher the steer in? It was his wife's. I'm having it cleaned at a special place I know of. Yes, yes, of course. Better try again, Hudson. There was no answer. There were no further questions. Inspector Henley knew his men. Time ticked away. The clock was quite loud. For an hour it ticked in the silence. Finally the perspiration began to bead his forehead. Jim Hudson began to talk. All right, Inspector. I'll tell you. I I guess I lost my head when she flew at me. Oh, size ten and she flew at you, Hudson. I told her we were through, that I was going back to my wife. She heaved the coal scuttle. Then it... It was at the beaches at Pevensey Bay on April 13th, sir. She grabbed the poker. I defended myself. We had a devil of a struggle. She fell, struck her head on the andiron. She was dead. I must have gone completely crazy. I, I went into town, but... But that night... But, and the saw, I was afraid to tell anyone. I mean, my record. And... Sergeant, I've got something here, Inspector. In this biscuit tin. Yes, you have. Neat packing job, I must say. <laughs> Not much left of the poor girl, is there? I want a check of every hardware store in the neighborhood where Hudson lives. Uh, oh, yes, near the railway station. Got that, Sergeant? I want the sales tip on those implements and the clerk who sold them, if possible. Yes, Inspector, I remember the incident perfectly. The fellow came in whistling, asked about the knives in the window. He bought one, then asked for a small saw. Here's the slip, sir. Well, this says April the 9th. Hudson claims he didn't buy these things until the 13th. It was the 9th, Inspector. I'll stake my life on that. It's no good, Hudson. You bought that knife and that saw on Friday the 9th. You went to Pevensey Bay prepared to do exactly what you did do. If we ever had evidence of premeditation, we've got it now. You're under arrest, charged with willful murder. And I must warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence. Each clue in its place. The case was complete. Closed as tightly as that same Gladstone bag. Which can be found today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Coven, and starring two of radio's foremost actors, Clifford Carpenter and Lawson Zerby, in Strange New World. This is The Mysterious Traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. Now, 
you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as we follow two young flyers on a routine flight which suddenly deviated from normal and brought them to a strange new world. Our story begins aboard His Majesty's ship, the submarine Valiant, somewhere in the vast Pacific. Captain Farnsworth, commander of the Valiant, makes his way along the narrow passageway of the submarine to the sick bay and uh, steps into the small cabin. No. No, Pete, no. You're wrong. Wing flaps are down. Well, we're going to hit how is he, Higgins? He's not too good, sir. Lord knows how many days it was adrift on that life raft. Did you find any identification on him? Oh, yes, sir. His dog tags. Here they are, sir. Thank you. Daniel Walker. Lieutenant of the United States Air Force. Of course, sir. I knew from his lingo, sir. He was an American. That's quite so, quite so. Well, Higgins, you'll have to do what you can for him until we reach a ship with the doctor. Ah, yes, sir. Pete, where, where am I? I think he's coming out of it, Captain. Yes. Who, who are you? Lie quietly, Lieutenant. I'm Captain Farnworth, His Majesty's Navy. You're aboard the submarine Valiant. We picked you up an hour ago. Pete, the island. I tell you that you were forced down while flying, Lieutenant. And what happened? Happened? Yes. Pete Mendez and myself were flying a C-47 from Honolulu to Japan. There were only the two of us. Pete was the pilot. I was holding down co-pilot. We were attached to air transport and had aboard a cargo of medical supplies. We were six hours out of Honolulu... And I'd taken over the controls. Pete was relaxing in his seat. Chewing on a chocolate bar. Hey, where's the newspaper we picked up in Honolulu, Junior? Right behind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what's the good news? They exploded another atomic bomb. In Los Alamos. Oh, yeah? Anything else of interest? That's not enough. Hey, what are you doing? I haven't seen that paper yet. I'm sorry. What are you getting so worked up about? What's one atomic explosion, more or less? Oh, you're just a kid. Wet behind the ears. <laughs> okay, Pop, relax. I was there. When the first one was used. Where? Hiroshima. Oh. Well, I didn't know that. There's a lot you don't know, Junior. Yeah, well, give me a chance, will you? You weren't on the plane that uh, actually dropped it, were you? No. I was piloting one of the escorts. That must have been quite a sight. Yeah. I hope I never live to see another one. Yeah. Hey, look at those clouds ahead. We may be in for a rough trip, Junior. Better let me take over. must be hitting creeks of 150 an hour. We're right in the center of it. Wide open? Wide open. How about turning back? We can. We're an hour past point of return. We've been taking this beating for hours. When's it going to let up? That's hard to say. The worst typhoon I've ever seen. Look at the compass completely haywire. Any idea where we are? No, not anymore. How long do you think we can take this? 
What I'm worried about is the gas. We're running low. Yeah, how much we got left? Two hours. Two and a half at the most. Well, that means we're going to have to sit down and a drink. Yeah. Our one hope is that this lets up and we find a ship to sit down there. You better prepare a life raft. Stock it with plenty of water and rations. Okay. I'll take care of it right away. Well, looks as though we've come through it. Yeah. Well, that was one to tell your grandchildren about. There go the engines. Okay, Junior. Get back to the raft. Be ready to launch it when we hit. All right, Pete. Put it down nice and easy. Those are my intentions, Junior. What's the altitude? 1,600. 14. Water rock? Well, not too bad. 800. 600. 4. Wing flaps are down. Get ready with the hatch, Junior. Right. We're down to 100. Hang on. You okay, Dan? Yeah. Now, but you're still in fast. Here, give me a hand with the rack. Right. There sure is a lot of water out there. Climb in, will you? Huh? Oh, yeah. That's... 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 Yeah. Okay, let's shove off. So far, so good. shoved off into a sea that was running plenty high. In a few minutes, the waves carried us off and the sinking plane was lost to sight. Pete rigged up a distress flag so we could be more easily spotted. And then we settled back to wait. For two nights and one day, we drifted in a fast-running sea with a heavy overcast. There wasn't a sign of a plane or ship. By the dawn of the second day, the overcast lifted and the sea became calmer. It was around noontime that Pete spotted the island. We rigged up a small sail and began paddling for it. Do you recognize the island, Pete? Any, any idea which one it is? Ah, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Looks fairly big. Yeah. Now look, the channel through the reef and into the lagoon is directly ahead. The tide is helping to carry us in. Good. So we want to end up on those reefs. Brother, we're really moved. Yeah, another minute or two and we'll hit the beach. You think there might be some natives on the island? There should be. It certainly looks big enough. I don't see any huts or anything. No. Hold on, we're going to hit the beach. Yeah. Well, that does it. How about and give me a hand? Let's drag it out of the water. Yeah. Right. Oh, it sure feels good to be able to walk. Yeah. All right, pull. Okay. That's it. A little more. Okay. There. Oh. Hey, look at those coconuts. Yeah. Let's begin looking the island over, Junior. See if we can find any natives. Pete took some food and a canteen of water from the raft and we started walking along the beach, now and then cutting inland to look for water. It took us six hours to walk around the island. And the sun was just setting as we got back to the life raft. Sit down, Junior. Take a load off your feet. I don't mind if I do. Cigarette? Yeah, thanks. Well, we found fresh water. Signs that natives had once lived here, but they sure aren't here anymore. No. That's strange, considering the island's three miles wide, almost two miles long. I've seen natives living on islands one half the size. I wonder why they left. Got any ideas? No. Well, it's just you and me. Sit tight and lead the right Riley. So we're picked up. Yeah. And the first thing we'll do in the morning is Run up a distress signal on one of the palm trees. We'll also get brush together for a fire. Check. What do you say we have supper and turn in? It's 
been a long day. Okay, Junior. Sounds like a good idea. Wake up. Huh? Huh? Oh, what time is it? 2 a.m. 2 a.m.? What are you waking me for? Go to sleep. Well, Pete, I, I heard something moving around in, in, in the brush inland. Oh, probably wild pigs. Island's full of them. Go to sleep. It, it, made, it made too much noise for a pig. Oh, holy smoke, Junior. It certainly wasn't an elephant. Well, maybe not, but... Do you hear that? Yeah. I heard. Does that sound like a pig in the brush? Ah, maybe there's a herd of them. Who's kidding who? Okay. Okay, where do I get my 45? All right, come on. Let's have a look. And step lightly. Sounds as if it's over that way. Yeah. And listen to that. It almost does sound like an elephant. Look, the moon's coming out from behind those clouds. That's a break. Yeah, and we're getting closer. Well, we'd better take it easy. The sound of it, that 45 of yours isn't going to do much good. Yeah, I got the feeling I'm, I'm dreaming all this. I've been on dozens of tropical islands like this one. Biggest thing you'll find on any of them are wild pigs. That's no wild pig, brother. Yeah. That's why this seems like a dream. What the devil could it be? You see anything yet? No. The top of those palm leaves are sharp. Yeah, okay. Listen to that. Good Lord. Look. It was like a nightmare. A nightmare you can't escape from. Try as you will. There, 50 yards away in a clearing in the underbrush, was a monster. A monster that baffled the eye and brain for a moment, then began to come into focus and take shape. What I saw before me was a water crab, only a hundred times larger than the crabs that scurried along the beach. The monster crab in the clearing stood fully 20 feet high with legs the thickness of palm tree trunks. The antenna on its frightening head was yards long, and its eyes were unbearably evil, even from a distance. Its twelve legs carried it slowly but lightly through the underbrush. Don't move, Dan. We don't want to attract its attention. Pete... I don't know. It's a crab of some sort. Only a hundred times larger than any I've ever seen. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Oh, the size of it. It must be at least 18 feet high. And those claws. You could bark a car under its belly. I can't believe it. It's moving off. Yeah. Others like it around? I don't know. I hope not. Look, it's moving toward the beach. Yeah, I see it. Yet I still can't believe it. Maybe it's an hallucination. Both of us having the same hallucination, hardly. Well, how do you count for it? I can't. It's on the beach going into the water. Yeah. There it goes. Look, we're going to stay here, Junior, and just sit tight for the rest of the night. Oh, it's good to see daylight again. Yeah. Let's take a walk over to that clearing in the underbrush. Before we... Saw it, huh? Okay. Now, what do you think about it? Well, I don't know. 
So maybe what we saw was just a fluke of nature. Possible. Yes. Possible. Yeah, what other explanation can there be? I've got one. But it's so incredible. I... Well, it's happened. I'll tell you later. I want to think about it some more. Well, here we are. Here's, here's the clearing. Yeah. We first saw it by those palm trees over there. Look. The tracks of the monster. In the sand. Look how large and deep the tracks are. Yeah. It was a beautiful morning. Until now. Come on. Let's follow him. Okay. Now they... They go through the brush here and, and towards the beach. Yeah. Yeah, this is... This is the way we saw it go. Oh, the brush is flattened as though a tank had rolled through here. There's no problem following it. Look. This is where it came out on the beach. Yeah, and there's the tracks on the sand eating into the water. It's out there. Somewhere in the waters of the lagoon. Yeah. Look. Let's unload the raft and then paddle out into the lagoon. What for? Holy smokes. Don't tell me you're going looking for that monster. Well, not exactly, but I got a hunch. And I want to check on it. It's crazy paddling out into that lagoon. How, how do you know it won't attack? Once we get out there, I don't. It's just a chance we'll have to take. But why? So that I can find the answer to all this. Are you going with me? Okay. I'm going with you. Feet for an hour I've been paddling you across the lagoon. All you've been doing is peering down into the water. Are you trying to spot the monster? No. Well, if it isn't a monster you're looking for, what then? Stop paddling. I think we found it. Found what? Take a look over the side. Into the water. I don't see a thing. Oh, the sun's been in your eyes. Keep looking towards the bottom. Till your eyes get used to the water. Uh, I don't see it. But wait a minute. I can hardly make it out, but... There seems to be a wreck on the bottom. A big one. It is a wreck. That's a battleship you see on the bottom. A battleship? Yeah, don't you understand? This island. It's Bikini. Bikini? You mean... You mean when they dropped an atomic bomb on those old battleships? Yeah. A dozen ships on the bottom here. All sunk by atomic bomb tests. Bikini? Hey, you don't think the island's radioactive, do you? Well, not enough to do us any harm. It's been years since the test. You said you had a crazy explanation for that monster we saw last night. Does that tie in with all this? Yeah. How? Now, look, you'll think I'm nuts, but here goes. We dropped a bomb into this lagoon to see what an underwater explosion would do to those warships. Now, what are you getting at? We know what the atomic bomb did to the ships. But do we know what effect it had on the fish life? Here in the lagoon. Are you saying that the monster crab we saw last night was the result of the bomb dropped into this lagoon? Well, what other explanation can there be? Remember, Dan, the effect of the bomb on the survivors of Hiroshima left wounds and illnesses that doctors had never seen before. Now, who's to say that the radioactivity in this lagoon couldn't have caused fish life to multiply in size a hundredfold? It can't be. It just can't be. Well, why not? Radioactivity causing a crab to... To, to grow a thousand times bigger? Well, how else can you account for that monster crab we saw last night? I don't know. Well, think about it. Meanwhile, let's paddle back to the beach. The two of us paddled silently across the lagoon to the beach and dragged the raft out of the water. Time and time again, I found myself turning got over the waters of the lagoon as Pete's words ran through my mind. His explanation seemed an impossible one, and yet, well, what other answer could there be? The two of us sat on the beach smoking, watching the moon come up over the lagoon of Bikini. 
sure is a beautiful night. Yeah. You think they'll send search planes this way, Pete? Well, sooner or later, they'll find us. As long as we have fresh water and fish, we're okay. Yeah, I guess so. Pete! I picked the water from the group. Holy smoke! Why, it's been churned up as though there were a dozen whales out there. Could it be whales? Not in these waters. Pete! There's something enormous out, out there threshing a lot. And maybe it'll break through to the surface and we'll be able to see it. Could it be that monster crab we saw last night? Oh, it's something bigger, much bigger. Bigger? Well, that would make whatever it is a couple, couple hundred feet in length. Yeah. Uh, the way the water's been churned up, there must be a fight going on out there. Look. They're coming out of the water. The monster crab we saw last night. I know we're following. There's two others. Dan, some of them are coming this way. Come on, we've got to get out of here. What about our supplies? There's no time to grab them. Get a move on. This way. There were... There were dozens of them. Coming out of the water. They came out of the lagoon. They were fleeing the fight that was going on out there. Whatever it is, it's in the lagoon. I don't want to see it. Well, it must be the side of the destroyer. Where are we running to, Pete? I'm getting pushed. All right, stop for a minute. Get our bearings, huh? Dozens of them. Overrunning the island. Look. The moon's getting behind the clouds. Oh, just on luck. Can't see much now. Those crabs. They're all over the place. Yeah. Maybe we might push on. No, no, no. We might run into one in the dark. We're better off staying here. Why don't you be heading this way? Can you make out from which direction it's coming? No. The moon would come up behind those clouds. And who's that? It's coming closer. What are you doing with that 45? It's better than nothing. Maybe the sound of shots might frighten it off. It's getting closer all the time. I can't see it. Can you? No. Keep your eyes open. Sounds almost on top of us. Pete! There it is! Pick up! No! 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 Pete! No! Pete! Right there, the claw. The red bat. My chair. Oh, my quiet. Let me look. Good Lord. <laughs> Don't move, Pete. I, I'm going back to the peaks for medical supplies. No, 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 don't. No, it's too dangerous. It's no use anyway. No use? I'm dying. No. No, Pete. Oh. Listen to me. You know, first... First thing in the morning, if Raft is still okay... Shove off. Don't. Don't stay here. It's too dangerous. Please, let me go over the medical supply. No, 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 no. When you're rescued, explain to them. Strange new world. Sea life. Multiplying hundredfold. Radioactivity. Of atomic bomb. And lagoon. Sea life will increase. Overrun. Seven seas. So. Oh. Oh. Pete. beside Pete's body for the rest of the night. Several times I heard monster crabs passing in the brush nearby, but I didn't leave. And the morning island was once again peaceful. 
Tranquil. I buried Pete on a high hill and then returned to the beach. The raft was overturned, the supplies gone. I overhauled the raft, gathered coconuts and a supply of water. By noon, I was paddling across the three-mile lagoon of the channel through the reefs that led to sea. As dusk came, I was several miles out to sea. Two nights and days slipped by without my seeing a plane or ship. And more days... Soon my water was gone. The days that followed were ones of thirst and torture. The will to live left me, and I lost consciousness. Next thing I remember was feeling hands lift me, and finding myself here. Where did you say I am? His Majesty ship. Submarine Valiant. Submarine Valiant? Yes. Where? Where'd you pick me up? Fifty miles southeast of the island of Bikini. Bikini? Bikini. Now you must lie back. Rest. What you need is sleep. Sleep. Sleep, yeah. That's it. Close your eyes. That's it, lad. He's fallen asleep, sir. Yes. Poor devil. Did you catch his ravings about monsters and all that, sir? Yes. Poor chap is clearly out of his mind. Must be, sir. Yet his ravings gives the one the, the chills, they do. It's quite so, quite so. General, take it. What happened, sir? Feels as if we've hit a derelict. Carry on, take it. Aye, aye, sir. What was that? Well, walk you up, did it? Too bad. Well, we may have hit a derelict. It's hard to say. Captain's looking into it. Now, rest easy, lad. Oh, Tossed about like a ball. Oh, I can't speak. He's trying to step out. Nonsense, lad. I just fall back and leave everything. Now hear this. No. Now hear this. Captain Fawns was speaking. We're being attacked by some creature of the deep. All crew members to battle stations. <laughs> Mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our trip? Oh, what happened to the submarine valiant? Well, after a two hour battle with an unseen enemy, it managed to escape. But at a naval court of inquiry, Captain Farnsworth was at a loss to explain the nature of the enemy his submarine had been in battle with. Well, of course, there was uh, Lieutenant Dan Walker's testimony. But obviously, the poor fellow was out of his head. Who ever heard of monster crabs 20 feet high and denizens of the deep as large as a destroyer? The court could reach no verdict in the matter of the submarine valiant, and there the case rested. Now, if uh, by some chance you should happen to take a voyage across the Pacific, and one night as you stroll on deck, you see a, a giant... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler. Now you can follow other tense and exciting adventures of The Mysterious Traveler in the current issue of The Mysterious Traveler magazine now available. Bill Tonkin speaking. This program came to you from New York. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps it would help if I told you a story about a friend of mine who had a most unusual experience. You see, he was executed first and then committed murder afterwards. 
I call his story The Man Who Lived Twice. My story, The Man Who Lived Twice, begins on the gallows, where Professor Carl Muller, world-famous scientist, is about to die for murder. As the executioner finishes adjusting the rope around the condemned man's neck, the warden speaks. Well, Muller, is there anything you wish to say? Only this. You are hanging me for a crime I did not commit. Very well. Then I shall become a criminal, a murderer. And you, warden... You shall be one of the first to feel my vengeance. Proceed with the execution. Professor Williams. Yes, sir. Come quickly. Of course. Everything's ready and waiting. Right here. Good. Start the artificial heart pumping. Of course. Thanks to the governor's special order, everything went smoothly. Look, John. So you got it. Yes, the law has Professor Muller's dead body, but we have his head. The head containing the wonderful brain of Carl Muller. The governor thought I wanted to dissect it, but we'll bring it to life. You must work fast. In ten minutes, we'll, we'll have brought back to life the genius that was Carl Muller. We've won, Professor. Look, his eyes, they blinked. Yes. Now they're opening. <laughs> they're staring at us. His brain lives and knows what we're doing. Now, John, we must find some way to let that mighty brain we rescued from the grave speak to us so that its great work may be carried on. Come, John, we must work fast. For many days, Professor Williams and John tried to build some kind of vocal apparatus which would enable Carl Muller's still living head to speak to them. But each effort failed. Until at last they became desperate. Another failure. John, I'm afraid we're beaten. There must be some way, Professor. Look, Muller's eyes are watching us. He knows what's happening. I'll bet he could tell us what to do if he could talk. Yes, but he can. What was that? Something in the road outside. A, an automobile accident, perhaps. Oh, of course. John, we may not be able to keep Muller's head alive much longer. Unless we can communicate with him. I need his advice. There must be some answer. Muller's notes give full details. Someone at the door. Quick, lock it. No one must enter this room. Uh, help me. I... It's someone who's hurt. I... He's bleeding. I... That crash we heard. Please help me. Accident. Can I hit the tree? Thrown out and blooded. Hey, here, catch him. Quick. I've got him. Uh... He's fainted. Put him down on the couch here. Uh, let me look at him. Hmm. What is it? This fellow's dead. A bit of steel has apparently entered the temple here and pierced the brain. I'm surprised that he even lived to reach the door. Dead? Well, then I'd better phone the police to send the morgue wagon. Yes, I... No. Wait. Yes, Professor? John, look at this stranger who dead body fate has brought us. His head is the same size and shape as Carl Muller's. Professor Muller's brain should fit into this stranger's head almost exactly. Yes, but listen... Here we have a sound body with a damaged brain. Over there is Muller's brain alive, but with no body. John, we're going to do it. We're going to put Muller's brain into this stranger's body and truly bring Muller back to life again. Say, uh, Doctor, tonight's story has me a little worried. Do you think you could give us a little idea of what happens next? Mm, certainly. You're going to spend no more than 40 seconds talking about Adam Hatt. Oh, I can do it in 30 Gentlemen, the way an Adam hat keeps its smart appearance is something to marvel at. There's very little fussing with brims or constant blocking because an Adam is made of high-quality, long-wearing, all-fur felt. Adam hats are designed for fashion, too, coming in a wide variety of distinctive shades and shapes so that you can choose the Adam that's right for you. There's a flair to an Adam that just naturally does something for a fellow. Prices are only three forty-five to $10.00 at Adam Hat stores and authorized dealers everywhere. Tomorrow, make an investment in your personal appearance. Buy yourself an Adam Hat. Now, back to Dr. Weird. And now to continue my story, The Man Who Lived Twice. For an hour, Professor Williams and John worked swiftly to carry out the task of transferring the living brain of Carl Muller 
into to the body of the stranger, so uh, providentially brought to them by fate. At the end of that time... Turn up, John. He's breathing. The operation was successful. Yes, I can feel a pulse beat. Switch off the pumps. See? He lives. He lives. The body, yes. But the brain, will that live too? Only time will tell us. For weeks, the two scientists tended their amazing patients day and night. And then one day, the stranger's body moved, a sign that the transplanted brain had taken control of its new home. So after that, it was only a matter of days before Carl Muller was able to get up and dress and inspect in a mirror the new body that has become his. Uh, yes. Yes, Professor Williams, you have done well. Excellently. I find it hard to believe this is truly me, Carl Muller. But it is. And how the world will marvel when it learns the truth. Uh, the world, yes. Tell me, this body that is now mine... To whom did it belong before our little transfer? Hmm? You were named Larry Johnson, Professor. That's about all we know. You see, there was an accident and... Yes, I know. I witnessed the arrival of Mr. Johnson, I remember. But you know nothing of this Larry Johnson who staggered in so fortunately that day to present me with his body? No, we never made any inquiries. We didn't want to attract attention. You're right. It does not matter who I was. What does matter is that I am now Carl Muller, a genius with 50 years of life still ahead of him. But, of course, I cannot use the name of Muller. What do you mean? Carl Muller was convicted for the crime of murder because the subject died in an experiment. So Carl Muller must stay dead. But as Larry Johnson, a new scientific genius, will arise to astound the world. What does that mean? It means that no one must ever know what happened in this laboratory. No one ever know. It must be a secret, always. And for another reason, too. Those fools who convicted me, they must be made to pay, and they shall be their lights. What are you saying? I was convicted of murder. I shall become a murderer. The judge, the prosecutor, the jury, they shall all feel my vengeance. Yes, madness, Muller. Listen to me. Your brain has been affected by what's happened. My brain is clearer and stronger than ever. I shall have my vengeance secretly, cleverly. My victims, they will cow in terror the thought I am striking back at them from beyond the grave. I've been making my plans as I convalesced. No, we'll stop you. Will you? I think not. John, look out. He's got a scalpel in his hand. He's going to... Oh. You killed him. Yes. Now it is your turn. No, oh, stay away from me. You must die so my secret will remain safe. No, man. I'm a genius. The world is recovered my feet before I am through. But enough of talking. Uh, no. Uh, no. Let me go. Let me... Oh, stand by me. Suffer the same fate. Now, now no one in the world knows that Carl Muller, who died on the gallows, lives again. A few hours later, Carl Muller left the house. His plan was simple. He would take over Larry Johnson's identity, claiming that the accident he had been in had given him amnesia, and he could remember nothing of his past. Confidently, he walked into town, and then stopped to ask the first policeman he met the way to the address he had found in Larry's wallet. Pardon me, officer. Which way is Michigan Avenue, please? Why, look at... Larry. Larry Johnson. Why, yes, of course I'm Larry Johnson. What of it? What of it? I'll show you what of it. There, put up your hands or I'll plug you. Oh, just a moment. What is this? I, I have done nothing. You have done nothing? Uh, look, officer, I've been in an accident. My men You'll be in a worse accident if you try anything. I've got you now. But I don't understand. But... You'll understand when the judge sentences you to hang, you murdering rat. To hang? No. No, this can be. I... You'll find out. Why, I've done nothing. Let go of that gun. No. Let go. I'll no. plug you. Give me that gun. I'll shoot no, you. I'll, I'll shoot you. Yeah. Oh. I warned you. Well, you had it coming. I've only saved the state the price of a trial. Uh, yes. Yes, you have. What? What was Larry Johnson wanted for, anyway? What were you wanted for? <laughs> for uh, holding up a bank messenger and then killing Officer Clancy in your getaway, that's all. Yeah, and for stealing a getaway car which you wrecked and abandoned out in the suburbs. Uh, no. 
No. Once it's for murder. The, the body I, I took was once it's for murder. <laughs> no. Poor Professor Mala. To think that after being executed, you should get a brand new body, only to find himself wanted for murder all over again. <laughs> it looks as if fate was determined he should stay dead, doesn't it? And he has, uh, since then. In fact, he's buried in a cemetery outside. He's the only man in the world who has two graves and is buried in both of them. Would you like me to show them to you? Oh, you're leaving. Well, I hope you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. Yeah.